The esteemed Dr. Thomas Morstead entered the cell of the anomaly. He'd been warned and even chastised by his colleagues. But who in the Foundation could tell him what to do? He was the best at what he did, maybe the greatest in the whole history of the Foundation. As he entered the room, SCP-049 bid him welcome, cordial as always. So polite, in fact, that you'd never guess you were talking to a killer. Dr. Morstead knew the truth of what he was dealing with, but he also believed he could get through to 049. Calm him, exercise the devil from him. It was the meeting of two great minds, one of them human, one of them part human, part something that has never been clear. It was to be a battle of wits, and like so many great battles, this one would turn into a massacre. Before we get to that fateful meeting, there are some things you should know about the anomaly known as SCP-049. If you saw him in the street, the first thing you'd think of is playing, because 049 always looked the same. A man dressed in black robes with a plague doctor's mask. But this wasn't a costume that could be taken off. In fact, it wasn't a costume at all. It was him. The robes had grown out of him like an exoskeleton. That horrible mask with the pointed nose wasn't covering his face. It was his face. A kind of shell that had seemingly sprouted from bone. The first reports came during World War II. In a picturesque town in the south of France called Montauban, people had begun going missing. Children disappeared from their beds in the middle of the night and weren't seen again. Adults went to the market and never returned. Local authorities searched high and low. They scoured nearby woods and dragged the rivers, but nothing was found. Because what was happening wasn't criminal, there was no clue they could stumble upon or eyewitness who would break the case. No, this was something else. Something that the townsfolk could never understand. Word spread, and that's when a search and discovery team was sent from the Foundation. It was a cold, dark night in January of 1941 when the team found what they were looking for. They walked through the open door of a small house located not too far from the Grand Chateau de Richelieu to find a masked man sitting next to an open fire. And he wasn't alone. The floor around him looked like it was moving. Upon closer inspection, the team saw that the floor was covered with writhing, grasping bodies. It's patience, as it called them. Bienvenue chez moi, said the thing. Welcome to my home. Those so-called patients crawled towards the team, intent it seemed to cause harm. The hostiles, now known as SCP-049-2s, were deemed dangerous and had to be eliminated. A sight, it seemed, that didn't bother 049 in the slightest. It just sat there, occasionally looking up from writing notes in a leather-bound book as his patients were gunned down. Once the carnage ended, it simply closed its book, stood up, and allowed itself to be escorted away. And that's the story of how 049 ended up at the facility, becoming a guest of sorts, staying in a standard secure humanoid containment cell, Research Sector 02, Site 19. The few that came into contact with 049 remarked that it was a pleasure for them, with its impeccable manners, vast knowledge of medicine and human anatomy, sharp tongue, and stinging wit. They almost became spellbound listening to it, caught in the throes of its charms until, with the simple touch of its hand, it would drain the life from them. That's why SCP-049 was classified as a Euclid. That's why armed guards were always stationed outside its cell. It's why doctors took great precautions when in its presence, and it's why Dr. Morstead should have known better. Remember, when 049 was discovered in France, it willingly went with the team, like it was happy it had been found, as if it had planned its own capture. When it arrived at the facility, it didn't act like it was contained against its will. It was like it was returning home. Initial findings as to the biology of 049 were that it didn't require any sustenance at all, not even water. It seemed content to be left alone with its notebooks. It did not object when it was asked if it could share some of its notes and gladly handed over its journals. But upon examination, it was discovered that they were written in the language that no linguist or cryptologist has so far been able to translate. It's apparent that 049 derives much satisfaction from seeing so-called experts struggle over its text. Unable to read those notes, a long line of doctors visited 049 in its cell, each fascinated by what they beheld. It was learned that it has traveled the globe. It speaks many languages, but prefers to speak what it calls les langues de l'amour, French. It asks for only one thing, warm-blooded animals. 
The facility agreed to supply 049 with various kinds, including rabbits, cattle, and even an ape on one occasion. Just like with humans, it could kill the animals with a mere touch of its hand, sucking the life right out of them. But that wasn't even the most incredible part. Soon those animals would rise again, as if reanimated by 049. They would become, for all intents and purposes, the living dead. And they were hostile. After several unfortunate incidents, they were taken from the cell the moment they arose and disposed of in the incinerator. This was not to the liking of 049, who would claim it had cured the animals. For it, the world was sick. It saw plague and pestilence everywhere, and the meaning of its existence was to rid the world of disease. Humans, it said, contained a virus and had to be cleansed. In the first days after arriving at the facility, 049 didn't seem to pose a threat to humans. It was quite friendly, in fact. It seemed aware of the fear it caused in staff and would often go out of its way to make them feel comfortable and safe. This was a ruse, of course, or a canard, as 049 liked to say. It had no intention to help humans. Hmm. No, it had come for humans. It wasn't trapped. It had set a trap. One of the first people to truly upset 049 was Dr. Raymond Hamm, a well-respected physician that had twice been a contender for the Nobel Prize for his more mainstream work. What had confused Dr. Hamm the most was not 049's clothes like exoskeleton, or even his ability to reanimate the dead, but the bag that it used. 049 was somehow able to pull a seemingly endless supply of surgical tools from that bag. Sometimes it would even pull out objects that were somehow larger than the bag itself. It was as if the bag connected to somewhere else. And that's what Dr. Ham wanted to talk about on that fateful day. With 049 on one side of the cell and Dr. Ham on the other, he asked, how is it that you can produce a great quantity of tools from that bag? I've observed you, and it seems to me that you are doing the impossible. Dear doctor, replied 049, the scourge, the great dying, cannot be fought with a handful of toys. My bag is merely the product of my imagination. It gives me what I require. You, dear sir, it seems, are limited by your imagination. It stopped for a second or two and stared at Dr. Ham. I detect you are unwell, it said, in a voice not as amiable as before. It's just a cold, said the doctor. Ah, just a cold. If you had seen what I have seen, you would not utter such insulting words. Dr. Ham pulled out some papers from a briefcase and approached 049, holding them close enough so it could read them. You see, said Dr. Ham, pointing to the results on the paper. Those animals you say you cured, they were not diseased. They were perfectly healthy before they died. And your so-called cure, it turned them into something quite terrible. We found that if they were left alone, they began to eat each other, and then themselves. 049 did not respond, and after a brief pause said only, A good day to you, doctor. Please close the door on your way out. You should get some rest. Ham refused to go and instead turned the conversation to this real interest, the bag, demanding that 049 let him see inside of it. Very well, doctor, 049 said, in private. 049 began to pull a series of long metal poles out of its bag, followed by a rolled up curtain that it hung between them, creating a kind of medical tent around Dr. Ham. It seemed to stare for just a moment into the observation camera outside of itself before whipping the curtain shut. Dr. Ham was discovered three hours later, crawling around the floor of 049's cell, now another mindless undead. When he was retrieved by security, 049 didn't even look up from his notebook. Dr. Ham didn't get the incinerator treatment, but he did receive a fatal dose of drugs, a mercy. A removal team was sent to 049's cell, but it had said there was no need for special extraction techniques. It would go willingly, wherever they wanted to go. It was not, it said, an enemy of the people. The Hippocratic Oath forbids me to hurt a human being, it said while walking to the interrogation center. My only desire is to offer you my services and expertise. The floors and walls of the interrogation center room were painted a bright white. Even the table was white, which contrasted with 049, a mass of black sitting in the middle of the room. During the interrogation, it refused to admit or even accept that it had killed Dr. Ham. I cured him. I removed the pestilence from his body, it said. It was later asked if it regretted its actions, to which it replied, Well, good sir, one always regrets the loss of a colleague for any reason, but I stand by my actions. The pestilence must be abated before it is too late. Every two weeks from that point, 049 was given animals. The scientists at the facility observed it time and again, touching the animals, killing them, 
before producing a saw or a scalpel and opening them up. Organs would be carefully removed with perfect precision. It was astounding to even train surgeons just how talented 049 was. I require a close relative of yours, said 049 one day to a young doctor, who expressed shock that it was asked for one of the doctor's family members. I mean a great ape, said 049, not your dear aunt. There were several instances of 049 displaying a crude sense of humor. Staff would almost forget that the thing that they were talking to wasn't human, almost. And it was Dr. Thomas Morstead that had supplied the great apes, orangutans in fact that had been rescued from the rainforests of Borneo, only to be taken to 049 South. Then one day something changed. 049 told Dr. Morstead that its work was done, that it accomplished what it had wanted to do, and could someone remove the cured animal from itself. I think you'd find that it's quite the work of art. A triumph, 049 said through the intercom. When the removal team entered the cell, they found the orangutan, or what was left of it. It was lying in the corner of the cell. The top of its skull had been removed, leaving its brain exposed. On its face was the expression of relaxation, and from its mouth it issued very soft squeaks, like that of an infant. 049 said, Tell Dr. Morstead that its rage mechanism no longer exists. I've removed the amygdala and made some changes to the hypothalamus and limbic system. It is cured and quite harmless. The next day, Dr. Morstead announced that he wanted to visit 049's cell himself after which he heard a chorus of disapproval from his colleagues, all telling him that 049 was now too dangerous. Dr. Ham was sick, replied Morstead, and 049 has assured us that he would never take another human life. He's never lied to us, and I'm going to take him at his word. It appeared that 049 had created the perfect specimen, so what was next? Dr. Morstead had to know. Everyone is sick, 049 told Dr. Morstead after the two had talked for a couple of minutes. The great pandemic has started. Fear not, doctor. I have a cure. No longer will you humans spread your disease. I'm afraid you are wrong, replied the doctor. This pandemic you speak of does not exist. We can happily live with our pathogens. We have done so for millennia. Dr. Morstead became angry that he couldn't get through to 049. I'm afraid you are suffering from paranoia. It is you who need to be cured. You have no idea, said 049, standing up. What are you doing? shouted Morstead. You promised you wouldn't hurt a human again. I'm not hurting you. I'm healing you, 049 said and leapt across the room in a flash. Placing a hand on the doctor's head, Morstead slumped to the ground. They were being watched in the observation room, and this had gone too far. He had to be moved to the containment cells, permanently. Mobile Task Force Epsilon 11 was right on the scene and burst through the door. Now imagination, 049 said to himself. Those humans have no imagination at all. He began walking towards the task force who opened fire on the anomaly, but the bullets bounced off its black coat and mask. SCP-049 calmly touched each of the members of the task force one by one, draining the life from them. The last one standing stopped firing and attempted to run, but again 049 leapt across the room, black cape billowing out behind him, and gently touched the man causing him to drop to the floor. 049 stepped over the bodies of the fallen team and walked out of the containment cell. The full details of what happened next are available only to the O5 Council, what are sometimes called the Overseers. The redacted report that is available reads, Standard Secure Humanoid Containment Cell, Research Sector 02, Site 19, Subject, SCP-049, Date of Breach, Redacted, Euclid Class SCP-049 Breach Cell and subsequently gained access to adjoining rooms and nearby buildings. Breach lasted approximately three days and five hours. Total casualties? Redacted. With redacted number of survivors requiring incineration therapy. Course of Action. Department of Science Alchemy Division suggested injecting anti-transmogrified disinfectant into Class D former prisoners who were transported to site and allowed them to come into contact with SCP-049. SCP failed to reanimate injected prisoners and cure them. SCP-049 acknowledged this failure and surrendered to Mobile Task Force Alpha-1. SCP-049 then requested to be contained. Present containment under responsibility of Redacted, Redacted. Present location of SCP-049, Redacted. As you walk down the halls of the SCP Foundation Site-19, peeking in the various windows at the anomalies contained there, you might catch a glimpse of a dark figure bent over a table, tinkering away like an artisan in his workshop. A vintage black apothecary bag sits next to him, open, and if you stop and watch for a while, you'll see him pull all manner of tools out of it, 
impossibly large tools, things that shouldn't fit in such a small bag, a bone saw, an IV stand, jars of fluorescent liquids, and needles the length of your forearm. You shouldn't be surprised. This is a place for impossible things, after all. Still, it's a curious sight, the shadowy man working so diligently, so quietly, focused singularly on his craft, whatever that might be. Only one thing could distract him from his efforts, you. He feels your gaze on him, and he looks up, dark eyes glittering from behind a beaked ceramic mask. He reminds you of an illustration you once saw in a book about the Black Death, the gear the plague doctors wore while treating patients on their deathbeds. Hello. He greets you in a friendly, heavily accented voice. His eyes crinkle beneath the mask, and if you could see his mouth, you know he'd be smiling. How are you today, dear fellow? Are you feeling quite well? He takes a step toward the window, stretching out one gloved hand, and you suddenly realize that you can't see where the mask ends and his skin begins. It's not a mask, but a part of his face. This is no ordinary man. Do you require help? I can examine you. He offers, palm pressed flat against the glass, a chill runs up your spine, and you realize that you should definitely not take him up on his offer. No matter how friendly he seems, how good his intentions may be, you wouldn't want to let the plague doctor treat you. He sat in his containment cell, fidgeting with his favorite scalpel. He dragged it over the surface of his work table, back and forth, listening to the sound it made. They had tried to confiscate his table, his tools. The guards had quickly learned that he had more of them in his bag. They tried to take away his bag from him, but, well, that didn't go over too well for anyone involved. So he was allowed to keep it, to fashion himself a makeshift laboratory in his lonely little cell. There was a time where they had given him test subjects, fresh corpses from the morgue for him to dissect and research. There was a time when the doctors here would come to speak with him, talking of cryptobiology and the pestilence he had dedicated himself to fighting. Those days were long gone. He had hidden away pieces of the corpses, tissue samples in jars of formaldehyde he could pull out when the monotony became too much. But the days of fresh materials, of enlightened discourse with other men and women of science, were over. How he missed those days, the chance to work with others as he once had. What had he done wrong? All he did was treat the sick. Sure, they didn't always understand their illness, didn't want to receive their medicine, but that wasn't a choice for the patient to make. That should have been up to the physician. Perhaps they didn't trust his expertise, didn't see how his work served the greater good. Like those who watched Jonas Salk invent the polio vaccine, or Louis Pasteur rid milk of bacteria, they were confused by the advanced scientific practices and feared that which they did not understand. He could forgive them for their ignorance. He was magnanimous that way. If only they would let him out of this infernal room, he could prove his work's worth to them. He could cure them all, begin a new era of wellness and peace worldwide. He didn't exactly sleep, but when he rested on his little cot in the corner of the room, he dreamed of that future, of a world healed by his touch. A knock at the door stirred him from his reverie. Someone. Someone was at the door of his containment cell. He glanced at the little window and saw a guard there with a tray of food. He greeted the man with an enthusiastic wave. Sustenance. He didn't require the food for survival, of course, but it helped his mind work more efficiently. It reminded him of a time before these fluorescent lights and these same four walls of crusty bread with fresh butter by the banks of the Seine. The little slot opened in the door and the tray was shoved through. There was bread, just as he hoped, a small dish of butter, a pot of jam, and a cup of tea still seeming. He picked up the cup at first, taking a deep breath. Ah, an herbal blend with fresh lavender. Lovely. He couldn't see the guard through the window anymore, but he called out to him just the same. Thank you for the libations. He still had his manners after all, even in confinement. He wished he could have gotten a better look at the man, seen the pallor of his complexion, a tremor in his hand. He thought he had spotted sweat beating on his forehead. Could he be ill? The case required further examination to be certain. He sighed, clutching the cup of tea tighter in frustration. Why wouldn't they just let him work? Why must they scream at the sight of his efforts, flee from his instruments? It didn't seem fair. Still, the pursuit of science rarely was a glamorous one. 
He had learned as much over the centuries. One day, though, history would look back on him kindly. Of this, he could be certain. He was just settling in and beginning to spread butter across the admittedly stale bread, when a horrible sound shook him to attention. He had heard the noise before, though he had never seen its source. It was an ear-splitting scream, a wail of pure agony, like the sound of a wounded wild animal. He had heard many, many screams during his life from patients and those who stood in the way of his work, but until he had been brought into custody of the Foundation, he had never heard a scream quite like this one. It was pure rage, devastation, and suffering mixed together, wet with tears, and loud enough to rip through human vocal folds. Whatever was crying out, it was no mere man. More screams answered it, and these were very much human. These sounds were more familiar to him. Shrieks of pain, of fear, of desperate but futile attempts to escape. Then the meaty thud of bodies falling to the floor, of torn off limbs hitting walls and windows, a loud crash, and the sound of something large moving quite quickly through the halls. Scientific curiosity got the better of the doctor, and he found himself moving back to his little window, face pressed to the glass so hard his beak nearly cracked it. He couldn't see much of anything, just guards running down the hall, weapons drawn. He saw one of them fire, heard the gunshot ring out, but what was he firing at? Then he saw it, a pale blur darting past the door. Whatever it was, it didn't so much as flinch when the bullet ricocheted off its skin. A long, thin arm crashed against the door, knocking the doctor backwards into his work table. He steadied himself and climbed back to his feet, taking in the damage done to the door. It was crumpled in on itself nearly ripped off the hinges, and whatever had plowed into it was already gone. From the sounds of chaos in the distance, it had disappeared around the corner, with the guards following it. He inspected the ruins of the door to his containment cell. It was useless now, hanging loose and open. Well, that was an invitation he was hardly about to decline. He grabbed his trusty bag, tossed his scalpel back inside, and set off to see what all the commotion was. It was easy enough to follow the trail of blood, stark and vivid red against the white tile floor, and the sound of gunfire, human screams, and that loud, long, painful wail he had heard before. He walked at a leisurely pace, taking his time, until the sound suddenly stopped. He rounded the corner and found a mound of bodies, guards and scientists, beaten and bloodied, almost beyond recognition. It was quiet here, save for one sound, the sound of weeping. There in the corner, huddled over with its face to the wall, was a pale, thin figure, its shoulders heaving with the force of its sobs. This poor soul was clearly in great distress. It was a peculiar sight, hairless and white, extended arms wrapped around itself as it cried. Excuse me, the doctor cried out to the pitiful creature. Are you all right? Do you need assistance? It didn't answer. It just continued to cry. Had something so despondent been responsible for this destruction? The dozens of corpses, the smashed in walls, the crumbled doors and shattered windows. It seemed impossible. Sure, it was large and looked strong, but he had never seen a monster cry before. This couldn't be a dangerous creature. Not when it was so sad. He would help it. But first, he would attend to some of these bodies. He sat his bag on the ground and pulled out several vials of liquid, a set of syringes, and a variety of other surgical tools he might need. Now after such a long hiatus, he could resume his work in a meaningful way. He couldn't be certain how long he worked reviving these poor souls and reconstructing their bodies as the pale creature wept in the corner. The sobbing faded into the background for a while, becoming a kind of white noise as he removed a liver here, placed it in a chest cavity there, poked and prodded, injected and extracted, testing out new methods alongside tried and true cures. One by one, the milky eyes fluttered open, rigor mortis stiff joints creaked into motion, sallow faces looking at his with the vacant gratitude he saw in so many patients over the years. He didn't need to thank him with their words. The work was its own reward. He expected more guards to arrive, to attempt to contain the situation, but none came, even as the alarm blared overhead. As for the morose creature, it didn't seem to notice his presence at all, not even when he had brought all of the intact corpses back to life. The patient shuffled around the room aimlessly, 
waiting for orders of some kind. The doctor tapped one on the shoulder and handed the reborn man a vial of thick black medicine. Give this to the poor fellow in the corner, please. It wasn't much, but it should calm him. Provide some relief from his suffering. The corpse nodded, mouth hanging loose and open, an eyeball dangling unseen from the socket. He shuffled over to the strange creature and held out the vial to it. It turned, lifting its head, and as it locked eyes with the cured patient, something shifted in its face. Its mouth opened wide, impossibly wide, and it shrieked, that same terrible sound as before. Tears streamed from its colorless eyes, its arms shaking with unbridled rage as its jaws locked around the patient's head. Like a boa constrictor, in one fluid motion it swallowed the revived man whole while the doctor watched in shock. He had been wrong. This was not an innocent creature caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. This creature, whatever it was, was deeply sick. He had never seen such an advanced, aggressive case of the pestilence. He'd heard rumors, of course, but never encountered it firsthand. As a doctor, he had sworn to do no harm, but in a drastic situation, drastic measures have to be taken. It was well known by himself and the doctors at this foundation that he could cause any and all biological functions in an organism to cease with a single touch. And so he approached the creature arm outstretched, ready to administer that necessary touch to protect the rest of his patients. As he approached, the creature turned to him, its eyes wide and blank, an endless stream of tears pouring from them spilling onto the floor. It shrieked again, mouth stretching wide enough to engulf his entire head, and ran toward him at a breakneck speed. I am so sorry you are not well, the doctor said simply, as his hand pressed to the creature's chest. As soon as the tough hide of the doctor's hand, which the uninformed might mistake for gloves, made contact with the unpigmented skin of the beast, its eyes closed, its muscles went slack, and it collapsed to the ground with a mighty thud. The doctor paced around the fallen creature, taking in the sight. Then something strange caught his eye. The creature's chest still rose and fell. Was it his imagination? He checked its pulse and thought it was slow and faint. And though it was slow and faint, it was very much present. The creature was still alive. It had merely been rendered unconscious by his touch rather than completely deceased. Curious, very curious indeed he muttered. Perhaps there were comorbidities present, other infections aside from the pestilence, which rendered the creature unnaturally strong, resilient to the usual courses of treatment. What would cause these abilities, this intense aggression? It seemed to be brought on whenever someone looked at the entity's face. If only he studied psychology more, the science of the mind and its inner workings. Since he had no experience with therapy, nor was he certain this creature could communicate using language at all, there was only one way to find out more about how this creature's brain worked. He would have to take it apart and see for himself. It was slow work, getting the massive creature back to the doctor's containment cell. He required the help of his cured patients, who grasped it by its massive limbs and dragged the limp body through the halls. Once back in a familiar environment, his work table ready and waiting, the doctor instructed his assistants to place the new patient on the table. It was a bit small, unable to accommodate the creature's distended limbs, but if he attempted to use an official foundation laboratory, he risked discovery and subsequent interruption. So it would have to suffice. First, he set up an IV stand, filled with a vivid green liquid. It was easy to find a vein. The creature's skin was nearly translucent. Now that he could be certain the creature would not wake during surgery, he could make the first incision. Scalpel. He held out a hand and his favorite surgical blade was placed in it by one of the helpful patients. Thank you. He slid the scalpel along the hairline of the creature, or where the hairline would be if it weren't completely bald. Once the scalp was removed, he set it aside for later, when it could be reattached. Bone saw, please. He held out his hand again, and again his assistant gave him the proper tool. This, however, was when things got strange. The doctor had always been a deft hand at cutting. He'd once even received tutelage from the great Robert Liston, but no matter how hard he tried to saw, it never left a scratch on the creature's skeleton. Naturally, this was somewhat frustrating. He wanted to study the creature's brain tissue, to get a sense for what was going up there neurologically. And he couldn't do that if it was impossible to saw off the creature's cranial cap. 
He blunted two of his favorite saws while trying. Thankfully, there was still a solution to access the beast's gray matter, a little trick he'd learned while studying the funerary practices of the ancient Egyptians. He produced a long curved hook from his bag and inserted it up the creature's nasal passage. With some fine maneuvering, he eventually managed to remove the brain. It was such a terrible shame that he needed to do it piece by piece via the nasal passage, but one makes do. All that was left was to sew the skin of the creature's head back into place. It was mid-stitch when a voice interrupted his careful work, nearly making him drop the needle. Hey, what are you doing? He looked up to find a guard, aiming a gun at his face. Excuse me, I am in surgery at the moment. Please do not interrupt. He admonished the guard, but the man did not listen or lower his weapon. In fact, he shouted something into the radio, code words the doctor didn't recognize. Then he fired a bullet into the skull of the patient standing at his side. How dare you? The doctor cried, readying himself to confront the guard, but it was too late. Dozens of other guards were swarming the room and neutralizing his assistants. Some in hazmat suits grabbed his arms and pulled him away from the creature on the operating table, no matter how hard he fought or how loudly he protested. Then something incredible happened, something wonderful. The creature opened its eyes and sat up. It looked directly at the guard closest to it, and the two saw one another's faces. The guard tensed, preparing for the worst, but nothing came. The creature simply stared, placid and quiet. No screaming, no tearing at flesh, no mouth opening wider and wider to swallow the man whole. I did it, the doctor shouted, overcome with elation. I've cured you. Now begins the rest of your happy life. He watched as the guards led the shockingly calm creature away back to its containment cell. The doctor's door was repaired, and he was returned to his state of captivity, but he never forgot the patient he helped that day, and how marvelous it felt to do such a good deed. Meanwhile, SCP-096's brain regrew within the hour and caused another massive containment breach, murdering a variety of researchers and guards, but the staff agreed not to tell SCP-049 about any of this. Better to just let him have this one. He really seemed like he needed a win. Please, good sir, I beseech you. As a man of science, nay, as a man of reason, you mustn't stifle my research at this critical juncture. You have no idea how close I am to finding a cure for this blasted pestilence. I need only a handful of live subjects to complete my research. The Plague Doctor's emphatic pleas fell on deaf ears, as a stone-faced researcher took notes on his latest pontifications. The Doctor, whom these clods had reduced so rudely to a mere number, SCP-049, banged his gloved fist up against the wall. And to think he once thought of these men as intellectual equals, fellow travelers on the road to scientific enlightenment. What a positively sick joke. Before the doctor got another chance to appeal for his right to experiment, the researcher left him alone once more. A truly sad state of affairs. Nobody appreciated a true scientist in this day and age. It was sure to be another day of languishing alone in this cell, wishing he had the capacity to do more. So he was surprised as anyone when the alarm started going off, and the door of his cell swung open automatically. The Plague Doctor stepped out of his cell and into the hall, where many other humanoid anomalies were roaming, confused as to why they'd been suddenly released, what was happening. As it turned out, what was happening was one of the most brutal Chaos Insurgency raids the staff of Site-19 had ever seen. It had been planned immaculately. You see, guards rotate semi-regularly at Site-19 due to the high-pressure nature of the job. Lots of deaths and mental breakdowns, as you probably correctly predicted. Even the administrative staff of the SCP Foundation are only human. Well, mostly anyway. So they're not immune to little oversights here and there. And it's in those oversights that expertly trained Chaos Insurgency infiltration agents make their living. No less than 15 of them had been working undercover in Site-19 for just over two weeks, and they did a fine job of lowering the metaphorical drawbridge for a heavily armed invasion force. The guards who weren't plants were quickly murdered by the infiltrators, and even some of the on-site task forces were quickly overwhelmed and gunned down by the high-precision rifles of the Chaos Insurgency's finest. While the frontliners were distracted by the sudden assault, 
the infiltrators found their way to the site's security control room and massacred everyone inside. Opening every single door in the site was as simple as putting in a few stolen key codes and flipping a few carefully remembered switches. Consequently, while Foundation agents and Chaos Insurgency mercenaries clashed sabers, high-priority anomalies like SCP-049 simply wandered the facility, watching the calamity unfold within. The Foundation was beset on all sides, shot at by heavily armed maniacs, and attacked from within by the numerous roaming anomalous entities that were eager to get their hands on Foundation personnel. Definitely not an ideal situation, to say the least. The Plague Doctor only had one thing on his mind, though. Hmm, this definitely won't do my research any good. Unless I can escape and find my way to a suitable laboratory. Oh, now there's an idea. But his scientific fantasies were soon interrupted by a Chaos Insurgency soldier swinging the butt of his M4 carbine into his avian exoskull with a supremely unpleasant crack. The doctor was dazed by it momentarily, the pain coming at him like a thunderclap, but the insurgent never got the chance to take another swing. Before the insurgent could do anything, the plague doctor lunged out with practice speed, grasping him by the throat. Immediately everything went black, and the insurgent's limp corpse collapsed to the ground. Serves him right, the doctor internally mused. Soldiers attacking medics is violating even the most basic rules of gentlemanly warfare. Then another flash of immense pain, as a different rifle butt collided with the back of his head. The doctor fell to one knee, feeling dizzy, but before he could retaliate, he felt the two sharp prongs of a cattle prod pressing up against his neck. The sudden rush of electricity surged through his neck, sending his muscles into a wave of involuntary spasms. The insurgents crowding around him chimed in with their own agonizing cattle prods, relentlessly shocking him until the flashes of white-hot pain soon became an oppressive blanket of total dark. Even on his most cantankerous days, the SCP Foundation had never treated him like this. When he eventually came to, he was still in darkness, standing upright, with high-tech shackles holding every limb in place. It was beyond uncomfortable for the poor Plague Doctor, but it succeeded in the task of keeping him under control. He couldn't move an inch. There were muffled voices beyond the dark, beyond the confines of this new containment, the modulated gas mask voices of insurgents and something else, faintly accented, oddly familiar, but he couldn't quite place it. Soon the voices were replaced by another sound, the grinding of crowbars levering nails out of cheap wood. With a creaking tumble, a rectangle of bright light opened up in front of him, populated by a number of silhouettes. On either side were Chaos insurgents in familiar tactical garb, and in between them stood a tall, well-groomed man with an expensive-looking purple smoking jacket and a pencil mustache. For a few fractions of a second, his face was a portrait of excitement. But as he took in the sight of the Plague Doctor standing before him, all the joy drained from his snooty countenance. What the hell am I looking at here? The man in the smoking jacket said. The doctor, indignant at such a response from the man who'd presumably ordered his assault, rasped, A man of science, good sir. The man in the smoking jacket ignored him and continued to berate the Chaos Insurgents with an odd level of confidence for someone reprimanding trained, cold-blooded killers. I wanted SCP-650, the startling statue, not this clownish Ren Fair cosplayer! What the hell did I pay you ruffians for? I was told you Chaos Insurgents were the very best at this, and for your hefty price, I expect excellence! The rant continued much like this, leaving everyone in attendance, the insurgents, the plague doctor, feeling thoroughly exhausted by him and unable to do anything about it. You see, this wasn't just any Chaos Insurgency client, your average tin pot dictator or arms dealer, you know the type. This was the one and only Pascal Leggett, one of the most famous or rather infamous Anart collectors in the game. He'd been a founding person of interest for years due to his dealings with the Chaos Insurgency and Marshall Carter and Dark Limited, all to the end of expanding his Anart collection, but his vast wealth and connections had always shielded him from Foundation probes. For those unfamiliar with the subculture, Anart, short for Anomalous Art, is exactly what it sounds like. Artistic projects with anomalous properties to give it that extra kick. One of the most popular groups of interest dealing in Anart is the iconic Are We Cool Yet? which, incidentally, 
had recently excommunicated Pascal Leggett for being an exceedingly wealthy, uptight square who really didn't represent the collective's rebellious ethos. And considering his response was to pay the Chaos Insurgency to raid Site-19 for a few pieces for his own private collection, costing him millions of dollars and both groups many lives, it was safe to say he wasn't taking it well. Look, we got you that other statue and that thing killed four of our best guys, so how about we just call it even? said one of the insurgents. I'm sure you can have fun with Birdbrain here, too. Pascal tutted and reluctantly dismissed the hired guns. Having the Plague Doctor here definitely wasn't ideal, especially considering he wanted to host the ultimate Anart exhibition to put our we cool yet worthless Somme nous devenu magnifique to shame. But he would make do with what he had. Perhaps he could say that 049 was a commentary on the ever-present nature of disease in mankind's life and our forever archaic approach to it. Yes, yes, that would do nicely. Needless to say, the Plague Doctor was infuriated by all this. The violence against his person, the kidnapping, the disrespect, and most of all, the interruption to his precious research, especially considering how close he'd gotten to finding a cure for the pestilence. But instead, he was soon spirited by a legion of heavily armed goons from his wooden box to a glass one in one of Leggett's many opulent hallways. There were other glass cases on either side of him, and more on the other side of the hall, all too reinforced for the Plague Doctor to even smash through it on his own. Damn it. Leggett's own private Anart exhibition, probably wedged between his oversized dining room and his jewel-encrusted crapper. Occasionally, Pascal himself would jaunt down the hallway to gaze upon his new stolen Anart pieces, and of course the Plague Doctor would try his best to reason with him. I am a patient man, Monsieur Leggett, but this is simply barbaric. By what right do you imprison me here? Is your intention to deprive the world, the entire human race, of my valuable medical breakthroughs? Could you live with that on your conscience, good sir? There was never any meaningful response. The Plague Doctor soon learned that Pascal Leggett didn't like his art interactive. It was simply meant to languish away in a glass box being watched, being passively looked at. Those Chaos Insurgency louts hadn't even bothered to bring his notebook or medical bag, so he was without the tools to even perform his experiments. As loathed as he was to admit it, this was even worse than being locked up by the SCP Foundation. But all this wasn't entirely unfamiliar. There was something in the glass box across from the Plague Doctor that he vaguely recognized back from Site-19. He'd never seen it up close, but he'd heard researchers speaking about it, and even seen a few pictures. And such a strange construction it was. A peculiar, haphazard sculpture made from concrete, rebar, and spray paint. Quite ugly, in this humble doctor's opinion, but there was something oddly entrancing about it. And for reasons beyond the doctor's recollection, four of Leggett's men stood around the glass box in where it was being stored, always watching. The men were frequently switched in and out, as though they were watching in shifts, always fixing their gaze on its peculiar, malformed body. Maybe it was all the electrical shocks and knocks to the head, but he just couldn't remember why Pascal was having the piece so carefully observed. But he knew on some primal level that the secret to this would perhaps be the key to his own escape, if only he could remember. Still, time passed. Pascal drifted in and out, sometimes with guests, the Plague Doctor had learned not to speak. These animals could not be reasoned with. As a scientist, he would instead carefully observe until his observations bore fruit. He noticed that Pascal's guests, all people who looked equally as wealthy and pompous as Pascal himself, all seemed to look right over him and instead focus on the ugly statue across the hall, still forever observed by any four of Pascal's men. Some of them looked actively nervous, just being in its presence. Curious, the Plague Doctor made a mental note of this, just as he did when Pascal gave his guests a reassuring pat on the shoulder and told them, Please calm yourself. It's harmless while my personnel are keeping an eye on it. Little by little, the Plague Doctor's memories of his infamous neighbor had begun to return. He knew what he must do to escape. Now all he needed to do was wait for the perfect moment. Soon enough, Pascal's mansion was filled with a bevy of Anart snobs from hither and yarn, a private soiree to show off his new collection. They wandered the halls in three-piece tuxedos and designer ballroom dresses, sipping champagne from imported crystal. All such lovely, refined, high-society people. And if the good doctor's plan went off, as he intended, 
They would all be such lovely, refined, high-society corpses. The Plague Doctor waited until, mercifully, he and the four members of personnel watching the sculpture were the only ones left in the hallway. He'd been so good, so patient, that none of the men guarding the sculpture at present had ever heard him make a noise. He was so invisible to them that, in all likelihood, they probably didn't even notice he could make a sound. And that worked for his purposes just fine. Though in any case, if he wanted this to work, he would need to time his plan perfectly. Even a fraction of a second out of place and the whole thing would have dire consequences. Still, the doctor was still a Frenchman at heart. And as a Frenchman, he knew he would rather die nobly in the process of escape than remain captured by this worthless buffoon. He'd be sure to take as many of these men down with him in the process as he was able. The Plague Doctor exhaled deeply, drawing a lungful of air, then bellowed as loud as he possibly could. The sudden, unexpected noise was so shocking that it jogged the four watchers almost reflexively to turn and look at him. And in the split second that they did, the Plague Doctor closed his eyes. In the dark, time seemed to move slower. Perhaps due to the doctor's keen focus, cultivated over many a century, he listened carefully to the sequence of sounds. Glass shattering, four choked gasps in sequence, four brutal crunches, then nanoseconds later, more glass shattering. The plague doctor's eyes snapped open just in time. Just as predicted, the sculpture, being entirely unobserved, had smashed through its glass case murdering all four members of personnel by snapping their necks, and then smashed through his own glass case to do the same to him. The Plague Doctor had cut it so close, in fact, that he opened his eyes to the face of the sculpture staring into his own, its concrete limbs wrapped around his neck. Very good timing indeed. With a sigh of relief, the Plague Doctor slipped out of the sculpture's concrete grasp and back down the hallway, keeping his gaze fixed on the sculpture the entire time. He had heard it decimate Pascal's men, he certainly didn't fancy undergoing the same fate. The second the Plague Doctor backed around the corner, rendering the sculpture, or as the SCP Foundation called it, SCP-173 out of sight, he could hear terrified screaming coming from the other end of the hall. He was not a sadistic man, but the Plague Doctor would be lying if he told you he didn't take just a little bit of pleasure in hearing that sound. Somewhere else in the vast mansion of Pascal Leggette, the sculpture was slaughtering its way through servants and party guests while the Plague Doctor searched for some kind of exit. Anyone who dared get in his way was given a swift and merciless touch of death, sending their body unceremoniously to the ground. Anyone in his way was preventing him from finding a cure for the pestilence, and thus endangering countless lives. It was, of course, regrettable to have to kill anyone, but some sacrifices must be made for the greater good of mankind. Well, it's not necessarily always regrettable per se. On his way out while the murderous rampage of SCP-173 seemed to distract anyone of note, the Plague Doctor just so happened to encounter a fleeing Pascal Leggett, hoping to find some kind of escape himself. It seemed that now fate was on his side once more. To have his jailer right here in the palm of his hand would be such a perfect parting gift. Funnily enough, Pascal was far more talkative to him now. He rattled off a rapid-fire series of threats, bribes, and pleas, claiming in the end that he never meant any harm. He was the one who freed the Plague Doctor from the SCP Foundation. They were on the same side here. All this was for the art. No offense was ever intended. Pascal Leggett simply lived for art. Then die for it, good sir, the Plague Doctor said. And with a single touch, Pascal's eyes rolled up into the back of his head, and he fell to the ground, dead. It was one of the few non-scientific deaths that he felt truly no guilt for. After some time searching, the screams around the rest of the mansion eventually went silent. That did wonders for his focus. It didn't take long for the Plague Doctor to locate an exit, a fine mahogany door with elaborate adornments befitting a man as gaudy as Pascal and began strolling towards it, his chest swollen with pride and a sense of accomplishment. Then he blinked, and a few feet in front of him stood the sculpture. It was there so suddenly that the Plague Doctor fell backwards in shock, but he devoted everything to keeping an eye on that monstrosity. With everyone else in the mansion presumably dead at this point, it had now come back for him. It stood there staring silently, ready to exact the terrible price for freeing it as soon as the Doctor dared to blink. The Plague Doctor began crawling backwards down the hall, 
just wanting to put some distance between himself and the sculpture. As the seconds passed, he could feel his eyes drying out until the inevitable blink. The sculpture was standing right in front of him now, gazing down, almost mocking. It had closed the distance so quickly, if the plague doctor blinked again, he was sure that his eyes would never open again. All it had to do was wait as the seconds passed, and the doctor began to feel his eyes drying up again. That subtle sting quickly grew into a nagging pain that could not be denied. Sooner or later, he was going to have to... BANG! The front door flew open, and in an instant the hallway was filled with heavily armed troops, all wearing the familiar black and gray of the SCP Foundation. The Plague Doctor had never been so relieved to see the organization that had kept him locked up for so many decades. For once, they'd saved him from something even worse. Of course, the sculpture didn't say anything, but the disappointment of losing that one more victim seemed to radiate off of it like a lingering bad smell. The Plague Doctor willingly gave himself up, and heavy machinery was brought in to pick up SCP-173, with the help of the iPods to make sure it didn't try any funny business in transit. Pascal had gotten away with his shady dealings for years, but the brazen attack he funded against Site-19 was now enough for the Foundation to track him down. When his corpse was found in the halls of his own home with no obvious cause of death, we can happily tell you that nobody was disappointed. By the evening, the Plague Doctor was happy to be back in his cell. His research could continue here, and in time he knew that the personnel of the SCP Foundation would listen to reason and comply with his demands. After all, science marches on, regardless of who chooses to march with it. But he would forever feel a little nervous in Site-19 after that, knowing the concrete monster he was sharing the building with. He hoped that if ever there was another containment breach involving that thing, that it didn't feel like paying him a visit for old time's sake. SCP-049 also known as the Plague Doctor, is an SCP Foundation fan favorite. This charming anomalous surgeon can terrify with a glance and kill with a touch. In terms of his origins, his methods, and his thought process around a disease he calls the Pestilence, this is one of the most mysterious SCPs out there. And thankfully, we didn't have to investigate this one alone. We made a community post asking you, the fans of SCP Explained, to give us your questions and theories about the good doctor that we all hope doesn't give house calls. And you didn't disappoint. Let's grab our masks and hand sanitizer and take a look at what you had to say about SCP-049. First, the questions. Bob Candle asked, why does he refuse to tell researchers about the pestilence? That's a good question, and also one of the biggest mysteries surrounding 049's lore. For the uninitiated, the Pestilence, also known as the Great Dying, is the nickname given to an unknown disease that SCP-049 has dedicated his life to curing, whatever curing means to him. When asked by Foundation researchers, 049 refuses to give up even the most basic information about the Pestilence, such as how he diagnoses it, what its effects are, or how it's transmitted. It seems that part of the reason that 049 refuses to tell researchers about it is that he apparently assumes that they, as fellow doctors, inherently know what he's talking about when he brings up the pestilence. He has acted with confusion and frustration during questioning, and 049 seems to believe that the pestilence is such common knowledge among medical practitioners that it would be a waste of time to explain it, if he even had the words to do so. DadGamer56 asked, why is he so cooperative if humans have the pestilence he wants to cure so bad? One of the most remarkable things about 049 is how reasonable he's been with Foundation staff in the past. He's polite, friendly, and treats his jailers as equals when he's not murdering them and turning them into zombies. But that is a good question. If he believes humans have the pestilence, why is he so cooperative with them? Thankfully, the answer here is simple. While 049 believes that the pestilence is widespread, he doesn't believe that every human is carrying it. In fact, when he was first contained by the Foundation and brought into an SCP facility, he complimented the staff on how little pestilence there was inside the building compared to the outside. While we don't know what leads 049 to think a person is healthy or diseased, we do know there is a distinction, and he's cooperative with those he sees as healthy. Star Doggo Gaming asked, How would he interact with 610, aka the flesh that hates, I wonder if he would view the infected as pestilence. Another great question. 
610 is an extremely dangerous Sarkic SCP that presents as a zombie-like virus that causes horrific fleshy mutations. Because of the extremely high infection rate of the flesh that hates, it's been quarantined in its present location in the isolated Siberian wilderness. While it would be too dangerous to bring anyone or anything into contact with the flesh, we're betting that 049 would find the flesh utterly repulsive. Whether even he would be able to cure this horrific infection is another question. The flesh that hates is best left alone at all costs. M Cipher 50 asked, SCP-049's notebook appears to be written in a language no human can decipher. Could another SCP like 343 or 662 decode the notebook? The answer to this is a solid maybe. These two SCPs, known as God and Mr. Deeds respectively, may be able to translate the contents of 049's mysterious leather-bound notebook. The problem is, given that we've seen 049 is a pretty terrible doctor when it comes to anything other than raising mutant zombies from the dead, the contents of his notebook might just be as useless as the interviews with him have proven to be. That said, it probably is worth a try, just to find out if he's actually been pretending to write this whole time. Green Angel Snake YT asked, Do other living creatures like pigs, cats, or literally any animal have this thing he calls the pestilence? What even are the living things he considers cured? To the best of our knowledge, 049 only believes humans can contract the pestilence. How do we know this? This leads us to our next question. Mia the Hot Dog asked, If he touches the immortal lizard, will the lizard die and be rid of disease, or will the lizard be immune, or will it attack the doctor? The Foundation did attempt to terminate 682 with 049, but the effort was unsuccessful. 049, when encountering the lizard, commented that only humans can contract the pestilence. When he tried to touch 682, the lizard swiped at him with its claws. 049 then requested to leave, and later interviews revealed that the Plague Doctor felt emotionally disturbed by his time with 682. GamerDuckYT asked, where did he originally come from? While evidence suggests that 049 is extremely old and very well-traveled, he was first discovered by the Foundation in the town of Montabon in southern France. Given that he speaks fluent medieval French as his first language, it's safe to assume that France is probably his country of origin and could have existed for hundreds of years, if not longer. Interestingly, his famous Plague Doctor appearance is more similar to those first worn by Italian doctors in the 17th century, which only deepens the mystery of SCP-049. Garrett Eborn asked, Why does he insist that he isn't doing harm when he's clearly in violation of his Hippocratic Oath? 049 does seem to regret the harm he causes, but he also believes that the small sacrifices are necessary in the quest to cure the pestilence. Also, a fun little history lesson. Given that 049's knowledge of medicine appears to be medieval, meaning potentially as early as the 5th century, he actually would have predated the Hippocratic Oath coming into universal use by doctors, which didn't become widespread until the 19th century despite the oath itself first being created around 400 BC. Phoenix Fane asked, If he has to wear gloves of any kind, would he still kill you? All evidence seems to point to no. Only skin-to-skin -skin contact with 049 is fatal, so a good pair of gloves could really be a lifesaver. Alice Verdugo asked, What would happen if he went one-on-one -on -one with a shy guy? Would he cure him or not do anything? Well, we can't know for sure, because SCP-096 aka the Shy Guy isn't human, it's likely that 049 wouldn't even consider him infected. If the two came into contact, it would probably result in a stalemate, much like the time SCP-096 faced off against SCP-682. However, if it did come to blows between the two, 096 is undeniably a much more dangerous combatant and may be able to narrowly defeat the Plague Doctor in a direct confrontation while in its rage state. Anything Goes asked, If he died, could he bring himself back to life or have something prepared to bring himself back to life? Like a lot of anomalies, it seems that 049 is abnormally hard to kill, given that he's seemingly impervious to most physical damage. However, seeing as 049's resurrection is both a lengthy medieval process and never brings its subjects back correctly, it's likely that if someone could successfully put 049 down, he wouldn't get back up. I'm Not Coming asked, We know that doctors are wearing masks to protect patients, but is his mask part of his skull or face? 
All of 049's clothes, including his Plague Doctor mask, are technically part of his body. The mask is part of its bone structure, and the other clothes are like layers of skin. Which leads us nicely to the next question. Requiem asked, if the clothing around him is skin, does he shed it? We're not sure, but it's definitely a thought we all wish we could forget. Oh, God. Now, let's take a look at some of your more interesting theories. Clarence Ilium theorized, pestilence is sin and he's trying to take it away. This is certainly an interesting theory. While we can't find much in his file that suggests 049 views the pestilence as a result of sinful behavior or the concept of sin itself, it's worth considering that his medical background seems to come from medieval times. Medical science was in its infancy back then, and many still believe that diseases were the result of loose morals or even demonic interference, so there might be some truth to this theory. Thomas Hess theorized, I feel like he isn't really bad. All he wants to do is help and cure everyone, but his cure is death. If we're defining bad as a malicious desire to cause harm for its own sake, then this theory holds a lot of water. For all intents and purposes, it does seem that 049 does genuinely want to cure his patients of the pestilence, and he does seem to express remorse when they die. However, by his own admission, his cure is imperfect, and he hasn't found full success in curing the disease without causing death yet. Cat and Dog Live theorized, The Plague Doctor has seen the end of the world and travels in a loop back in time aiming to eventually stop it. The pestilence is the way each human's impact on the end of the world is, and once he touches their flesh they realize this and die of the realization of what they've done. The Plague Doctor may be looking for a human, or an SCP, that is pestilence-free. For what reason, we don't know. We don't have an awful lot to say about this one because there's no real evidence either way. But given that time travel does seem to be possible in the SCP Foundation universe, it's a cool possibility that we definitely can't rule out. It does, however, leave a lot of loose ends about the gaps in 049's knowledge, such as the fact he doesn't know about the Black Death. Vladimir Lenin theorized, He's the best doctor ever. He cures depression, pestilence, and sometimes his patients even come back from the dead. Five-star rating. This is certainly an extremely charitable way to view SCP-049, one that he himself would likely very much appreciate. However, considering he changes his patients into mindless, zombified mutants, a better course of action may just be to attend therapy. Chaonix theorized, the pestilence is death. He is literally trying to cure death. Well, this could be one interpretation of why 049 resurrects his patients as zombies. Death is something that affects all living non-anomalous humans and 049 seems to be selective on which humans it identifies as being infected with the pestilence. As a result, it is unlikely that the pestilence refers to death itself. And death is also likely a preferable alternative to being turned into a zombie by 049's experimental treatments. The Blue Guardian theorized, The pestilence is an entity in our collective unconsciousness described in SCP-5000-Y. This is an extremely interesting theory, and one that could hold water too. If you check out our series on SCP-5000, you'll find that the Foundation discovered a being known as It, hiding inside the collective unconsciousness of humankind. While the Foundation doesn't know about this in our dimension, it's possible that SCP-049 does, and simply doesn't realize that everyone is infected with it yet. But if this is the case, and SCP-049 realizes that the whole world is infected, he's likely to become a much more dangerous anomaly that refuses to cooperate with anyone. Moonleaf's 430 theorized, The pestilence is the foundation, and 049 is a disciple of the Scarlet King. This is another incredibly fun theory. However, there are two big problems. The first is that 049 has historically identified people with no Foundation affiliation as being infected with the pestilence. And the second, even more important issue is that SCP-049 is a highly scientific creature, whereas the Scarlet King hates the very idea of science with a burning passion. As a result, SCP-049 and the Scarlet King are likely natural enemies. And finally, Xerthrax theorized his theme song should probably be Gangsta's Paradise. It's just a speculation, though. On this theory, we wholeheartedly agree. And there you have it. Thanks to everybody who sent in their great questions and theories about SCP-049. 
Keep an eye on our community post to see what anomalous entity we need your thoughts on next. Got an SCP you'd really like us to cover in a video like this in the future? Let us know down in the comments. And remember to stay safe and healthy, because if you start feeling a little under the weather, you can expect a visit from SCP-049 sometime soon. The day is January 5th, 2012. At an undisclosed off-site location, Dr. Bannon leaves home and begins his commute to work. While in the car, he plays a video on his phone of his 12-year-old's birthday party from the previous night. The sight of it makes him smile. He would need that smile, he thought, as today was not like any other. Today was different. He had been anxious about the coming day for several weeks now, ever since the near-unanimous vote by the O5 Council that the containment chamber of SCP-106 was to be reopened. The opportunity was too great to be wasted, they said. The research that could be gained too tempting. Studying SCP-106's molecular makeup, its unique ability to open a pocket dimension, or even just the black sludge-like substance that appeared whenever the subject traveled through solid objects, was far too valuable to science to be outweighed by its potential for danger. He pleaded with them, begged them. But as Dr. Bannon and his team of seven researchers and accompaniment of 40 security personnel began applying their protective equipment, he couldn't help but think that he could have done more to stop this. Only God knew how hard he had tried to make them see reason. He had seen what had happened in previous containment breaches at the facility. He had seen what had done to the poor members of the SCP staff that became its victims. Fates worse than death. Limbs, a mangled mess of melted fused skin. Faces sunken and hollow with eyes and tongues burned out. He shuddered to think of what would happen if containment failed again this time. But despite his misgivings, he knew full well that regardless of his participation, this research mission would go on with or without him. And no one knew as much about containing SCP-106 than he did. Slowly, they proceeded to dismantle each of the containment facility's outer barriers. Sixteen separate circular chambers surrounded SCP-106's inner containment facility, each filled with a variety of different fluids. Fluids in each chamber varied in consistency and viscosity from ionized water to ammonia to kerosene. SCP-106 had the peculiar ability to be able to change its molecular makeup, to meld with objects and phase through solid forms like walls and doors. It could literally melt into the space between walls. This made containing SCP-106 almost impossible by conventional methods. Liquids confused the creature enough to slow him down, in theory anyways. The secondary containment chambers were a recent addition to the facility since the breach incident three years ago. Dr. Bannon had been a new addition to the research staff then. He had joined the team with bright eyes and a desire to use their research to help society. Little did he know he would instead do everything in his power to keep whatever they found from ever leaving the facility. Back then, a breach in the containment of SCP-106 led to countless deaths of SCP personnel when a researcher working on the top floor of the outer layer of the containment facility, unknowing of the danger they were in, brought his child to work one day. It was thought that the outer layers of the facility were enough to be considered a safe zone from the inner vault that was SCP-106's containment. But it wasn't enough to stop the old man. SCP-106 preferred human prey between the ages of 10 and 25, and the sound of a child's cry or yell was enough to capture its immediate attention. What preceded was unimaginable horror. But despite the unfortunate events of the previous breach, the expedition continued their descent into the bowels of the building. After several hours of draining individual fluid chambers one by one and inputting complex codes and biometric scans from simultaneous top security clearance personnel at a time, the expedition team had eventually reached the lower levels of SCP-106's containment facility. Suspended in midair by ELO IID electromagnetic supports, in the center of a vast subterranean chamber was a massive lead-lined steel cube, 40 layers thick, each layer separated by 36 centimeters of empty space, with support struts between layers randomly spaced to confuse SCP-106 from being able to phase through one layer to the next. Surrounding the cube on every surface were military-grade automated light systems capable of 80,000 lumens apiece, spaced every two feet around the perimeter of the inner containment chamber. The team felt their resolve chip away the closer they got to the suspended creature. 
Dr. Bannon motioned to overhead surveillance cameras above the cube and waited. Slowly, the cube was lowered to the ground until it hit the floor with a soft thud that lightly rumbled the ground above the expedition team's feet. With a resentful look at the red dot on the camera above, Dr. Bannon initiated the release protocol. All seven researchers inputted their key cards and submitted themselves to retina scans as the 40 security personnel established defensive positions on every side of the lead-line cube. For a moment, everyone held their breath in silence. You could almost feel the thumping of everyone's nervous heartbeats as they looked on to Dr. Bannon as he pulled out his key card. Everyone knew that as soon as it was scanned, the barrier between them and the old man would no longer exist. If the rest of the personnel could see Bannon's hand shaking as he gripped the key card tightly between his fingers, it would cause a possible mass panic among the whole team. As the spearheading researcher on the job that day, Bannon knew what he was up against, just the same as everyone else, if not more. He knew he couldn't show the fear that was pulsing through his veins. This wasn't his first rodeo here at the Foundation. He took a moment to collect his thoughts. Get a hold of yourself, Bannon, he thought. Dr. Bannon took a deep breath and scanned the card. The door slowly opened. Armed with powerful rifle-length flashlights, the researchers cautiously waded into the dark entrance of the large cube. Inside the structure, they found a cell with a solid steel door. Signs of corrosion could be seen on the door's handle and from the outer walls of the cell, rust and rotted iron, but no breaches in the integrity of the cell. There were no more security codes at this door. It was a simple, round metal turn lock. Dr. Bannon swallowed and began to turn the handle open. The sound of metal echoed through the chamber as the door creaked open. Each of the researchers immediately pointed their flashlights into the room. There in the corner, standing motionless and undisturbed, stood SCP-106, the old man. He stood with eyes closed, locked in a dormant state. The researchers had planned for this. SCP-106 spent up to three months at a time in this subdued state, in between periods of otherwise agitation, where it would lash out at its containment and attempt to breach. The research team wasted no time. They began to collect data on the creature's biological makeup, taking whatever samples they could from the walls and floors, and recording photo and video of the specimen while collecting any method of conventional analysis they could manage under the given circumstances. Dr. Bannon kept an eye on the old man's face the entire time, refusing to look away for one second for fear of it waking in the absence of his gaze. But to his relief, the creature did not stir, and the data collection process went smoothly. In a short period of time, the team had packed their gear and proceeded to carefully retreat from the inner chamber of the cube, making sure to keep their lights pointed at the creature the entire time. Once the team exited the steel-lined cube, they motioned again to the camera, and the huge, heavy doors of the cube closed back in on itself. The electromagnetic supports came back online, and the cube was suspended once again in three-dimensional space, without any immediate contact with solid surfaces. The security detail began packing up their positions as everyone seemed to take a collective sigh of relief. That's when Dr. Bannon noticed the security camera. The red dot on the device had stopped blinking. The camera was off. A sudden feeling of dread entered Dr. Bannon's stomach as he turned in time to see all the cameras around the room turning off. Before he could react, the chamber was plunged into darkness as the electricity left the room. In the immediate darkness came a deafening bang followed by a gust of wind and the weight of a force strong enough to shake the ground and knock the researchers off their feet. The power of the electromagnetic supports were down. The cube had fallen. Dr. Bannon shouted to his team to immediately exit the facility. He reached for his flashlight in the darkness. He could hear screams in the background, gunfire. He managed to illuminate the space in front of him and saw his molecular biologist, Dr. Burns, scrambling to get her gear back up over her shoulder. Leave it! Dr. Bannon cried, only to see a hand emerge from beneath her and pull her down into a black, viscous substance that swallowed her whole and then vanished into solid concrete. After hearing the cries to his left, he swung his flashlight just in time to see him. The old man had its hand on the chest of a security personnel and entered him, exiting through the other side, leaving a gaping hole in between. Bullets were useless, as they seemed to get trapped on entry of his body, slowly melting into his skin. SCP-106 then vanished into the floor and appeared behind another member of the security detail, 
grabbing him by the heel and dragging him as he pleaded and reached out to Dr. Bannon for help, pulling him halfway into the wall and then letting go as the creature melted into the space between the walls, leaving behind half the poor man's body bleeding and still squirming to get away. One by one, he could hear his researchers crying out for help before their voices were extinguished. Before he could think of what to do next, the power came back on, and lights flooded into the large room. He gazed at the creature as it stood momentarily stunned by the influx of light. The old man had gaunt, piercing, hollow eyes in a face covered in dark, melting skin, and a lipless mouth that displayed terrible, decaying teeth. Its corrosive hand had a grasp on the arm of Dr. Breyer, the physicist, burning the skin beneath its grip as he cried out in pain. And then, without warning, the creature placed a hand on the wall of the metal cube and disappeared into it, pulling the doctor in with him, into the pocket dimension between the walls. 48 hours later in Containment Site-19, located in the state of Data Expunged, SCP personnel open the door to an observation chamber where SCP-049 is led in wearing steel-covered hand restraints. On the other side of a glass panel, Dr. Blake sat impatiently, watching the humanoid creature known as SCP-049 the Plague Doctor take a seat and face his direction. Dr. Blake hesitated to address the entity that sat in front of him, but putting aside his reservations, he spoke into the microphone. Blake informed SCP-049 of the recent breach that had transpired at the SCP-106 containment site. The doctor seemed intrigued at the news, and when asked if he would provide assistance, the doctor agreed. SCP-049 had exhibited abilities to produce instances of SCP-049-2, reanimated corpses that he alone had the ability to control by will. In the past, the Plague Doctor had been allowed certain privileges, deceased subjects for the Doctor to experiment on, in his quest to finally cure for what he referred to as the Pestilence, though none of the researchers could pinpoint exactly what the symptoms of this perceived illness was, or any specifics about it at all. However, the supply of subjects was halted after an incident where SCP-049 struck a personnel member, killing him instantly with his touch of death, an ability that ceases all bodily function upon contact. Since then, the Plague Doctor refused to cooperate unless he was provided with live subjects for experimentation. Up to this point, he had been denied, but Dr. Blake needed the Plague Doctor's help, and time was not on his side. Dr. Blake agreed to provide SCP-049 with several live D-Class personnel in return for his assistance. As we've come to learn time and time again here on SCP Explained, the Foundation has no qualms about ridding the lives of these ex-death row inmates. D-Class are essentially the Foundation's lab rats, and treating them as such is more than worth it if dealing with an SCP-106 containment breach. Bring in the orange jumpsuits. Splendid, remarked 049. The Plague Doctor was taken to the secret site of SCP-106's containment facility and briefed on the old man's ability to meld and travel between walls, floors, and solid surfaces, as well as its ability to pull objects into its own pocket dimension, of which there was little information about. SCP-049 grew more and more intrigued by the description of the old man. Upon arriving, a laboratory was prepared at the site for SCP-049, for proxies to serve as lures to bait SCP-106, the team procured the bodies of a recent public transportation bus wreckage that had left 12 younger adults dead. As the plague doctor began his surgeries on them, Dr. Bannon could think only of the prior containment breach. The staff suffered many casualties to personnel, and ever since then, anyone under the age of 30 were barred entry within 20 miles of the containment site. Just as Dr. Bannon began to rub his temple to think about how they managed to return SCP-106 to his cell that day, there was a yell of excitement. Marvelous! cried out SCP-049. The Plague Doctor informed SCP staff that he had finished his work, and the surgeries had been of paramount success. The Doctor had indeed produced 12 instances of SCP-049-2 as predicted. The subjects were horrid abominations. Some with inverted faces, and others with added appendages and gaping holes where limbs should be. But they were ambient, and the research staff would soon learn if they would be enough to lure SCP-106 back into containment. Staring at the dimly lit white room crowded with malformed ambient corpses, Dr. Banning couldn't help but feel a sense of dread fill the pit of his stomach. 
but there was no time to second guess. With rifles and flashlights in hand, the team led the troop of SCP-049-2s out and down the concrete hallways and into a large freight elevator that led down to the vast chamber that housed the inner containment cube that was SCP-106's home since arriving at the facility. The drone-like Dash 2s did not speak during this trip. They did not blink. They simply stared straight ahead and acted at the behest of the Plague Doctor without any verbal input. The macabre parade arrived at the entrance of the cube and proceeded inside. Dr. Bannon informed SCP-049 that the Dash 2s needed to make noises of some kind, to cry out if they could. Anything would work, as long as it was audible enough. The Plague Doctor nodded his head and all twelve of the reanimated corpses began to scream in terrifying unison. In the hollow distance, a roar was heard in response. It dripped from the ceiling, first a drop, then many more until a puddle formed on the ground in front of the cube, the Plague Doctor approaching with intrigue. Out of the floor rose up the creature known as SCP-106, coming face to face with the Plague Doctor. Upon seeing the creature, SCP-049 was ecstatic. He began to examine SCP-106 closely without fear of bodily harm. With lightning speed, he produced a vial and pinchers from a medicine bag of black leather he kept under his robes and snatched a sample of the creature's black, viscous skin. The Plague Doctor was overjoyed. This will lead to my greatest work and the cure for the pestilence once and for all. But the old man did not seem to acknowledge or even enjoy the presence of SCP-049 and reacted violently, lashing out to strike the Plague Doctor. Sensing danger, 049 jumped back and willed the 049-2s to attack the creature. But before they could reach it, SCP-106 melted into a pool of black and disappeared into the floor. The instances looked around dazed. Another black pool appeared under one of them, causing it to fall into the portal and then out from the ceiling elsewhere in the vast stadium-sized room. Another pool opened up under one of the ambient thralls, sucking it down into the black abyss. And then another, and another. And soon loud thuds could be heard echoing through the chamber as bodies began to appear from the top of the hundred-foot ceiling, falling to a splatter on the concrete floor below. Upon witnessing SCP-106's abilities firsthand, SCP-049 nodded to Dr. Bannon as he swiftly packed up his medicine bag and made for the door only to be blocked by SCP-106's materializing form. The Plague Doctor grew angry and struck the neck of the old man with his cold touch of death, but it seemed to have no effect on SCP-106. The black substance on his body started to creep over 049's hand, sizzling and searing skin and flesh as it went up the forearm. Sensing danger, the Plague Doctor pulled out a large scalpel and in one quick motion, sliced off his own arm at the elbow. The severed limb fell to the floor engulfed by the black bubbling substance. SCP-106 then lunged at the doctor, whose quick agility allowed him to dodge and make for the doorway. Once in the hall, SCP-049 quickly pulled out a roll of brown gauze from his medical bag and began to wrap his bleeding wound tight as he hurried through the dimly lit corridor, lights flickering on and off. As SCP-049 turned a corner, a black substance appeared on the wall in front of him, and a chair came flying out of it towards his head. The doctor dodged it, but did not dodge a sharp metal spike that materialized from another hole appearing on the wall to his left. It pierced the outside of his knee, causing his movement to be slowed. Hearing the sound of clanking metal, the doctor looked up in time to see a desk falling out of another dimensional portal above him. He managed to roll sideways, missing the blow but straight into another one of SCP-016's portals, causing the doctor to fall through the wall and into the floor of the room below. With a falling crash, the doctor landed in the lower room and looked around quickly, seeking to regain his footing. The old man was nowhere to be seen, but he could hear him bumping in the darkness, traveling through the walls of the building. The plague doctor quickly analyzed the office room for something useful. On the wall, he found a map of the facility and studied the schematics. On the floor was a dead body. He crouched down close to it and stabbed it with a syringe from his cloak, animating the corpse and commanding it to run, serving as a distraction to lead SCP-106 away so he could make it to the adjoining hallway just a few hundred feet away. That was the armory. Limping from his injured leg, the Plague Doctor waited for the old man to be led away as he made it to the room. 
He began tearing through the weaponry that lined and leaned up against the walls in every direction, ignoring the automatic rifles as they were useless. There he found what he had been searching for, flash grenades. As the form of another black portal began to materialize in front of him, he pulled the pin and tossed the grenade in that putrid puddle. A blast of light erupted from within, followed by the sound of the creature recoiling in pain. The Plague Doctor pulled another pin, and another, and in this manner, he led SCP-106 toward the secondary containment facilities that had begun filling with fluid. When he reached a level where he could recognize the smell of kerosene, he stopped. There he waited, as SCP-106 emerged from the darkness in front of him. It snarled and howled, spitting black bits of tar as its gnarled yellow teeth came close to the Plague Doctor's face. The Plague Doctor calmly turned and waited out of the half-filled room. SCP-106 tried to lunge at him to follow, but it could not. It found itself rooted in liquid, unable to easily open a portal in the space between the walls. Stepping out of the room, the Plague Doctor reached into his cloak and pulled out a large match from his leather bag. Without glancing back, he struck the match and gave a ginger toss into the flames, sliding the door closed behind him. The resulting explosion and subsequent inferno damaged the walls of the secondary containment facility and caused significant seismic activity within the outer walls of the containment site. Emergency lights flickered on and off in the darkness, and debris rained down from the ceiling in every direction. In this haze of rubble, the Plague Doctor picked himself up off the ground and began to dust his cloak clean with the one hand he had left. Satisfied, he took a content sigh and began to make for the exit to the outside world, where he would resume his quest to rid the Earth of the pestilence that had plagued mankind. Though, an unexpected surprise made him pause. A flaming corpse began to emerge from a black hole in the wall beside him. SCP-106, intact and whole, the flames slowly seeping into his skin until they were all extinguished, and only smoke rose from his body. This time, the doctor was not so fast to react. The creature grabbed him by the face and slammed it into the nearby wall, cracking the marble surface. The black substance pooled around the Plague Doctor's face. SCP-106 opened a portal in the wall, pushing the Doctor's head into it. The events that followed afterwards are difficult to put together, as camera footage from the facility suffered severe damage due to SCP-049's explosion of the secondary containment chambers. SCP-106 was found back inside his cell in the containment cube, back to his dormant state, where he would remain again for the next few months. That is, until he would feel the need to hunt prey once again. As the doors of the 40-layer steel cube closed, the electromagnetic supports came back online, and the fluid chambers repaired and refilled. The committee is currently voting on whether or not to allow SCP-106's containment facility to be opened again. For now, the world could rest once more. Dr. Bannon could take a sigh of relief, but for how long, he thought. For that, there was no way to tell. Some anomalies kill for fun, others for food, others because they simply have no choice. On the other side of the coin, some want nothing more than to spread love, joy, and happiness. But it's rare that you see an anomaly that has genuinely pure intentions, but whose attempts to do good often turn deadly. One such figure, and the subject of today's tale, is SCP-049, the Plague Doctor. If you're at all familiar with the SCP Foundation, then you will have likely heard of the infamous Plague Doctor. For those of you who haven't, here's a bit of context for SCP-049. He appears exactly as you'd expect a Plague Doctor from the late medieval period or Renaissance periods, a tall figure shrouded in long black robes, a hood over his head with only a Venetian beaked mask protruding from underneath. These aren't just a fashion statement either. The SCP Foundation discovered that these are all part of SCP-049's physical body, sharing a similar structure to muscle and bone. The Plague Doctor's primary goal is to find those he considers to be infected with something he refers to as the pestilence. If he ever senses this affliction, he will attempt to make direct skin contact with the person carrying it. Why? Because SCP-049's touch is lethal, killing anyone he comes into contact with. You might think that's all the Plague Doctor does, goes from person to person killing them with his deadly touch, but you would be wrong. Once he's killed a victim, SCP-049 then begins performing a crude, outdated form of surgery on their corpse, 
using equipment he produces from his mysterious and apparently bottomless magical medical satchel. He injects a number of unknown chemicals into the corpse, which brings them back to life and turns them into an instance of SCP-049-2. Or, in other words, a vicious, mindless zombie. At present, SCP-049 is kept secure in a holding cell by the Foundation under watch by surveillance cameras for 24 hours a day. And that is where our story begins. The tale of a deadly, dangerous doctor and his days spent in captivity. Locked away in a cage, contained by the SCP Foundation, there he sits, alone. It is a tale known only by the simple title, Going Home. It begins with the plague doctor, left alone in his cell. He had been there for such a long time that he'd forgotten exactly how long. But there he sat, taunted by the sensation of pestilence around him. It was a small, almost undetectable feeling, but it reeked of decay and disease, hanging in the very air particles of SCP-049's cell. Although they had long since stopped the practice, the SCP Foundation used to send its doctors and researchers into 049's cell, bringing him cadavers as test subjects. The Plague Doctor would use these specimens to hone his craft, perfecting his method of transforming the dead into instances of SCP-049-2. But, of course, the doctors working for the Foundation weren't exactly free of disease themselves, and they too often needed to be cured by his touch and soon they stopped visiting SCP-049 in person, leaving him alone in his cell. Even these so-called people of science feared the true cure, it seemed. They would talk to the Plague Doctor via an intercom system, interviewing him and asking questions about what he did or how he felt. One question stood out to SCP-049. The Foundation researchers had asked him if he had any regrets for what he had done to people. The Plague Doctor thought it foolish to even ask. And then, even the questions coming through the intercom stopped after a while. For a time, SCP-049 was happy in his cell, left alone with his thoughts, safe from the diseases of the outside world. The Plague Doctor was at peace for a change, resting in comfort, until the familiar smell of pestilence returned. The presence of disease drove him to attempt an escape. Producing his medical implements from his bag he kept concealed in his robes, SCP-049 tried to pry open the door to his cell. He wasn't sure how long it took. The passage of time had long since stopped registering to him, but eventually he had it open, just enough so that he could pass through, out into the corridor beyond the chamber that he had been held in. There was no one else around, no doctors or researchers or Foundation security personnel, no one to stop the plague doctor from following the stench of the disease that had driven him to find a way out of containment. Navigating through the hallways of the Foundation facility, SCP-049 tracked the source of the disease to a locker. With little trouble, he opened it, finding a metallic box within. As he studied the container, his fingers found the button that opened it. It hissed as the gases kept the inside of the box mixed with the air. The cold vapor hit the plague doctor in the face, catching him by surprise and making him drop the box. Reasserting himself, the Plague Doctor bent over and picked up the contents of the refrigerated container, a single mosquito. It wasn't the insect itself that had drawn SCP-049 out of his cell. True, mosquitoes are known to spread diseases like malaria, but it was what was inside this mosquito that the doctor wanted to eradicate. Its blood sac was full, swollen with dark fluid that SCP-049 knew to be infected. Using the metal box as an improvised operating table, he produced his bag of medical implements, and the doctor began to operate. He retrieved a syringe from his bag, and a vial filled with thick black liquid. Half filling the syringe with the liquid, he plunged the needle into the mosquito and extracted the blood that the insect was carrying. The infected bodily fluid mixed with the medicine in the doctor's syringe, leaving the bug as little more than a dry husk. The plague doctor watched as the two substances mixed together, before stabbing back into the mosquito, filling the creature with a combination of both liquids. He refused to leave any trace of pestilence in the insect's body. The mosquito twitched itself back to life, looking around until it saw SCP-049 observing it. Who's there? It asked. Where's Merle? There is no one here but me and you, the doctor explained. You are in a prison, though. The wardens, it seems, have left. A prison? The insect responded. 
Oh god, I'm at sight 19! Naturally, it seemed rather strange for a mosquito to be able to talk, let alone know about the highly classified Site-19. But as is always the case in the SCP Foundation, the strange always has an anomalous explanation. You see, this mosquito was not like any other. For one, she even had a name. It was Leslie. As it turned out, Leslie was part of an SCP, one of the Foundation's own creation. SCP-3774. These were a genetically and cybernetically enhanced species of mosquito. Why would the Foundation spend time and resources creating something like this? Originally, they were designed as an undetectable, covert way of keeping tabs on persons of interest to the SCP Foundation. The Plague Doctor thought it odd that after having spent so much time in prison there, that he should finally learn the name of Site-19 from a mosquito of all things. Leslie seemed to be in a state of panic however urgently insisting that she had to get back to someone named Merle. SCP-049 had no clue what she meant. He'd never encountered anyone that went by that name, and had no idea where to even begin looking. I know where he lives. I can find it, the mosquito insisted. I just, I don't know how I could ever get out of here. She was wary of the creature she found herself talking to. Despite being a genetically engineered insect, Leslie was, for all intents and purposes, an agent of the SCP Foundation, and now she was currently conversing with an anomaly that she knew nothing about. But he wasn't trying to harm her. In fact, whatever the Plague Doctor had done seemed to have revived her. I have gotten myself this far, and now that I have, I have no further reason to stay here, the Doctor announced, holding a hand out for Leslie to fly up to. Then, then, then you'll help me get out of here? She asked, readying her wings and landing in his palm. I will, SCP-049 agreed. The pair introduced themselves properly, Leslie giving SCP-049 her name while he just instructed her to call him Doctor before they set out together. After almost a week of traveling on foot through rugged terrain and harsh winds, the Plague Doctor and his insect companion had yet to encounter another living soul. Thick dark clouds hung in the sky above them, and Leslie soon found it hard to remember what the sun looked like. She feared that she might even forget Merle's face. We're close, she said. Just a few more miles and then... And then we will arrive. SCP-049 finished her sentence. Tell me, Doctor, why did you come all this way with me? Leslie the Mosquito asked. You could have left when we got out, gone on your own way. In response, he gave one simple sentence. Merely because I wanted to. Finally, the intrepid pair arrived at a house once belonging to Merle. It was abandoned ramshackle, in a total state of disrepair. Decades had passed since anyone had set foot in the place. The living room that had once been so familiar to Leslie had now been transformed into a barren, empty space. The sight of it made her so distraught with sadness that she would have been sick, if mosquitoes could be sick. Merle, whoever he was or had been, was now nowhere to be found. One of Leslie's cybernetic enhancements was an internal positioning system, giving her all sorts of data and readouts, including a clock. It told her just how long she'd been away for. I've been dead for 200 years? The mosquito cried in the palm of the doctor's hand. Then, then Merle is, is dead. Everyone, everyone is dead. She kept repeating it to herself over and over, as if she was trying to convince herself of what had happened. Eventually, the words lost all meaning. As he held Leslie in his hands, perhaps the Plague Doctor felt sorry for the mosquito. After all, the Plague Doctor had always had a respectful, polite personality despite his frightening exterior. He had always believed that he'd acted in service of the greater good, trying to cure the world of pestilence, to bring the end of disease. He only ever killed because, to him, it was in his victim's best interest for him to perform his procedures. To his captors at the SCP Foundation, the doctor had been courteous and cooperative, and he acted the same towards his fellow SCPs. Not just Leslie, but even the sort of anomalies with nothing but hatred in their hearts. The doctor saw them as just further victims of the pestilence, in need of curing. SCP-049 sat in silence for a while with his mosquito friend, letting her mourn the loss of Merle and everything she had ever known. Where will you go now? He asked. Still in tears, barely able to speak through her sobs, Leslie decided that she wanted to stay where she was. The insect wanted to live where Merle had lived, in a desperate attempt to recapture the world that she once knew. Sitting in the Plague Doctor's gloved hands, still sobbing even though she had run out of tears, Leslie said, 
Any minute, any minute Merle will come through the door. The plague doctor held his tiny companion where she was, while she grieved. Then I will wait for him, he told her, here with you. SCP-049 is a fascinating bundle of contradictions. Arguably, he's the Hannibal Lecter of the anomalous world. He's educated, refined, and cultured. A scientific man with scientific goals, capable of communicating eloquently in both English and medieval French. As anomalies go, he's one of the more cooperative ones contained by the SCP Foundation, willing to understand reason and even showing a small degree of respect for his fellow researchers. And yet despite all this intelligence and refinement, underneath his dark organic cloak, a heart of deep red violence steadily beats. He's capable of ending life with a mere touch, causing all biological functions in the body to simply cease through means that are still unknown to science. Thanks to a series of inconclusive autopsies on SCP-049's unaltered victims, not only is killing easy in a physical sense for SCP-049 with a few notable exceptions, it's also been just as easy on his conscience. Such is the danger of the man or monster who believes unshakably that his goals are righteous. Any moral crime is permissible if done in service of seeing them through. And for those who die at SCP-049's hand, an even greater indignity awaits. His inhuman experiments, the gateway to a second life as an abominable crime against nature, a glob of malignant spit in the eye of God. But let's not get too ahead of ourselves here, students. We've mentioned SCP-049 countless times in passing before. Some of his strange tales, his interactions with other anomalies like SCP-682, and even with some of your questions and theories about this bone-masked scientific madman. And yet, he still remains a mystery. Perhaps to truly understand this fascinating walking question, we need to return to the beginning and give the classified files behind the Plague Doctor a closer look. Like many of the infamous anomalies discovered by the SCP Foundation, the files indicate that the discovery itself was first triggered by a series of mysterious disappearances in the sleepy town of Montauban, out in southern France. People across races, classes, ages, and genders were simply falling off the map, suggesting a highly indiscriminate assailant. Little did the Foundation know, in the beady avian eyes of their killer, they all had an extremely important commonality. Each and every one of them was infected with the pestilence, the invisible scourge, the great dying. Their killer was the only one with the proper diagnostic mind to even notice the infection. He was the only one who could save the world from this insidious, unseen threat. And then the SCP Foundation discovered his laboratory. The Plague Doctor had been doing his delicate work in an abandoned house on the edge of town. The kind of place that gets whispered about in local rumors. A bad place. A cursed place. Little did they know, it was only the latest in a long line of covert research centers for this singularly inspired medicine man. While some of the details were a little foggy in his memory, he'd been carrying out his work for a little over 400 years now, moving from place to place, causing strings of disappearances wherever he showed up. In his own words, he's an extremely well-traveled man. And still the cure for the blasted pestilence continued to evade him. He sat in that decrepit Montauban house, surrounded by groaning, writhing abominations of his own creation, taking meticulous notes. Nothing would break his concentration, not even the strangers in the black tactical gear with large guns kicking in his front doors. His many cured patients didn't take kindly to the intrusion on their treatment and decided to swarm the interlopers. What followed was a violent struggle between the intruders and the cured, resulting in several of the intruders injured and all of the cured dead once more. During all this chaos, the Plague Doctor never once stopped taking notes. When he was finished with his sentence, he willingly submitted to capture by this mysterious SCP Foundation. After all, when he told them about the true nature of his mission, they would of course see reason 
and allow him to continue his research. Sure, he may have committed a few crimes against nature on the way, but he was working in service of loftier ideals. You can only imagine his profound relief when he was first interviewed by SCP Foundation researcher Dr. Raymond Hamm in Site 85. He was in the presence of fellow scholars, people of science. He worried at first that he'd been captured by some group of common street scoundrels, when in fact, the hands of Providence had delivered him into the perfect place to continue his research. The warm light of fate was now smiling on him after so long languishing in the dark. All he needed to do was allow the scientists around him to conduct tests on his own body, while he conducted tests on others. At first, the SCP Foundation believed he was an anomalous human being wearing a costume, but they soon discovered that he was something very different. What they thought was a mask was actually an outgrowth of his skull, a kind of insect-like exoskeleton. The robes were also a component of his body, a kind of thick hide that developed over the years. The thickness of the hide itself also made him impervious to a great deal of physical damage. Despite his politeness, research notes on the Plague Doctor indicated that Foundation personnel found interacting with him uncanny. There was an oddly eerie quality to him, something indistinguishable that just felt off. The Foundation also found that the Plague Doctor, whom they initially addressed as Doctor rather than SCP-049 out of a sense of mutual respect, also came with a number of strange personal effects. These included a long pointing stick, similar to the ones used by medieval Plague Doctors to touch things without fear of contamination. This stick was soon confiscated. It didn't possess any anomalous qualities, but the Plague Doctor had a tendency to gesture grandly with it as he spoke and the Foundation feared he absent-mindedly take someone's eye out with it if he wasn't careful. The other two personal effects that the Plague Doctor prized greatly was his old-fashioned medical bag and the notebook that he obsessively recorded his observations with. The medical bag, which seemed to exhibit anomalous properties, contained a mix of archaic medical tools as well as some that the Foundation has been unable to identify. It's through the tools in this bag that the Plague Doctor is able to create instances of SCP-049-2. As we alluded to earlier, the Plague Doctor can kill with a touch, but that's only part of what he does to his victims. After causing all their biological functions to cease, he takes the tools out of his medical bag and begins performing crude surgery on their corpse, including using a syringe to inject an unknown anomalous liquid into their flesh. While the specifics on the Plague Doctor's modifications can vary from victim to victim, the result is often the same. They're converted into strange, shambling abominations that aren't capable of any kind of higher thought. For the most part, their movements are extremely basic and limited. However, if they're provoked, they can become frighteningly violent, more than capable of killing an armed Foundation guard if they don't remain alert during the engagement. The SCP Foundation was given a unique opportunity to understand more about SCP-049's twisted experiments. As part of his conditions for containment, they agreed to provide the diabolical doctor with a number of fresh test subjects. The doctor was eager to continue his work, and through watching him work, the SCP Foundation could learn a great deal more about him. Though we wouldn't even pretend that the Plague Doctor's work has ever been enjoyable to watch. They presented him with some live subjects and a much greater number of mammalian corpses. He would spend several days working intensely on each one, then documenting his findings in his precious notebook. As a mark of respect for the Foundation scientists around him, the Plague Doctor was more than eager to share his research with them and compare notes. He was always a talkative one, perhaps just as excited to discuss his experiments and theories with like-minded scholars after so many years of working alone. Here are four notable instances. First, the Plague Doctor was presented with a live D-Class specimen. He thanked the Foundation greatly for this gift, then set about his work. He asked the unaware D-Class several questions about his medical history while retrieving tools from his bag, before quickly touching and killing the man. He performed extensive modifications on the D-Class corpse, and when he was resurrected as an SCP-049-2 instance, he was barely recognizable as his original form. He was a bizarre, flailing creature, constantly groaning and gasping from the oblong-shaped hole that the Plague Doctor had carved into his chest. 
While performing this horrifying work, the plague doctor eagerly remarked to the observing researchers that the cure appears to be extremely effective. Next, he was provided the corpse of a recently deceased goat, which he also expressed gratitude for. After performing surgery on the creature, it was successfully resurrected into a bizarre SCP-049-2 instance. However, the plague doctor readily admitted that this definitely wasn't his best work, commenting, The disease was still in its nascent stage. My veterinary practice is rudimentary, but the patient responded well to the procedure. Next, he was provided the corpse of a recently deceased orangutan. The plague doctor was delighted by this, commenting that, given primate similarities to human physiology, this would be the next best thing from a true human test subject. However, this research became surprisingly fraught. He killed and reanimated the beast four different times, seemingly unsatisfied with the result each time. And when he failed to reanimate the creature a fifth time, he seemed disconcerted. In a debriefing discussion, the plague doctor said, I have learned so much from this, though I fear my early optimism was misplaced. I hadn't yet come across such a, a, a stumbling block on my road to the cure. More subjects like this would do a great deal in advancing my research. Next, it was provided with the corpse of a recently deceased cow. This irritated SCP-049, who wanted test subjects who were physiologically closer to humans. Still, despite his frustration, he continued to work. He took only brief breaks to enjoy a meal of hard cheese, salted pork, and thin crackers. Tests showed that SCP-049 didn't require sustenance to survive, but he enjoyed the act of eating and found that it helped him with his work. He embalmed the cow, rearranging its organs, and even inverted its head. However, this didn't impede his work. He injected it with a variety of liquids, which he described as the essence of the humors. When asked to elaborate further on this, he said, The pestilence may bring about a systemic imbalance. In such a case, before true healing can begin, one must find the humors in balance or the body will reject the cure. This is, of course, elementary knowledge for the practical physician. I would have thought you have learned this during your education. After being provided a working cattle prod to induce a little electricity into the equation, the plague doctor successfully reanimated the mutant cow. From here, things started to go downhill. Dr. Ham decided to conduct another interview with SCP-049, hoping to get into the finer details of his scientific process. However, they hit some major roadblocks. SCP-049 seemed to be unable to actually articulate the true nature of the pestilence or his process in seeking the cure. Even his notebook wasn't written in any known language and proved impossible to decipher. As the interview went on, the plague doctor seemed to become increasingly distressed, insisting on the importance of his work to helping the human race prosper and survive this terrible plague. All he needed in exchange was more test subjects. The practice civility that had been built up between the Plague Doctor and the SCP Foundation crumbled in 2017, after a tragic incident in the Plague Doctor's cell with Dr. Ham. When he entered to perform a very standard interview with the Plague Doctor, the doctor appeared to become anxious and asked Dr. Ham if he was feeling well today. Dr. Ham thought nothing of it and tried to continue the interview, but by that point, it was already too late. The Plague Doctor had come to believe that Dr. Ham was infected with the pestilence. And, of course, there was only one cure. The Plague Doctor gave Dr. Ham his touch of death. The man died instantly, and the Plague Doctor immediately went about turning his corpse into another SCP-049-2 instance. Because Ham was killed so quickly, he didn't have time to activate his emergency security signal, meaning what was left of him wasn't discovered until three hours later. Guards and researchers were horrified to see one of their own turned into a mindless, deformed monster by an anomaly they all thought they could trust. Following this tragic incident, Dr. Theron Sherman chastised the Plague Doctor for this appalling breach of trust and the cold-blooded murder of Dr. Raymond Ham. The Plague Doctor, in a state of increasing distress, insisted that Ham was infected, and he did all that he could to cure him. And while the Plague Doctor insisted a certain level of scientific distance from his subject, it seemed that deep down, he regretted the loss of a friend and fellow researcher in his endless quest against the pestilence. After this incident, the Plague Doctor truly became SCP-049. He lost all of his privileges and now remains under lock and key in Site-19. Whenever he's transported, he's kept in shackles and supervised by a number of armed guards. After discovering that the scent of lavender has a pacifying effect on him, 
It's regularly used as a tranquilizer against him during engagements. This is how a cordial ally can become just another prisoner in the eyes of the SCP Foundation. In a summary interview after the Dr. Ham incident, Dr. Elijah Itkin asked if 049 had any regrets about the incident, noting that he seemed oddly mournful. 049 paused before replying, Mourn. Perhaps I had not thought that. It is lamentable that a fellow doctor became infected, but the work continues. Regrettable as… as it was, Dr. Ham's death provided important insight. Living human subjects are the only way to proceed forward, I am decided. My cure is of little use on dead flesh, and I have gleaned all I can from your generous supply of corpses. My desires turn towards tending to those still living who suffer from the disease. Dr. Itkin replied that 049 would be disappointed on that front. He just laughed in response and replied, <laughs> Oh, doctor, I wouldn't be so sure. A world that's lost its way needs a healer, someone to patch up its wounds and tend to its pain. It needs a doctor. When day broke, the sun turned from a giver of life, the thing that wakes the rooster and makes the crops grow, to an indiscriminate killer, wiping out all organic life forms. The world seemed truly lost, but one anomalous being made it his goal to soothe the hurt, to make it safe to step into the light once more. The Plague Doctor had done his best with the limited resources afforded to him at the abandoned Foundation site. The scientists had left behind all of their equipment when the Red Sun came, when they all were transformed. He had appointed himself the site director, willing to take up the mantle when no one else would. He had assembled a brave, brilliant team of fellow anomalies. The verbose Dr. Spanko, the eloquent adventurous Lord Blackwood, and the charismatic but ravenous Ferdinand. There had, of course, been those who scoffed at his vision, who did not share his noble goal. The abominable, possessive mask taunted him persistently, trying its best to get under his chitinous skin. But he did not have time to waste on such trivial psychological games, and he ignored its taunts to focus on the work. It hadn't been easy. Capturing one of the infected specimens, the former human being turned mass of oozing gelatinous flesh by the unholy light in the sky. One had made its way into the abandoned facility, sliding its way across the floor with an air of confused malice. It wanted to hurt, but it didn't know where it was, who it was, anymore. But it was frightened, the plague doctor could tell. A good physician always knows and can sense the fear and pain of a suffering person. It made his heart ache to see, and he knew there was only one thing to do. Try to make this poor soul well again. Everyone, please assist me in escorting the patient to my laboratory, the doctor called out. This was once a man, and I believe with our combined intellect and resources, we can return him to his former state. Ferdinand took a step toward the slimy creature, licking his lips a bit. Do you think I could have just a little bit of it? Oh, I'm so hungry, doctor, he begged. No, no, it would go against my oath as a physician to allow any more harm to come to this poor fellow. The plague doctor shook his head solemnly. Ferdinand pouted, but did not press the issue further. No, the doctor rubbed his gloved hands together in anticipation of the next task. It is imperative we contain our new friend safely, if you would, please. He gestured to several of his previous patients, now reanimated and ready to aid him with his research. The shuffling figures surrounded the blobby entity, ushering it down the hall. Confused, lost, with no real sense of a plan left in its mushy consciousness, the creature followed where it was led. The group made it back to the doctor's laboratory. Cut! shouted Dr. Spanko from his perch atop a nearby shelf. Yes, indeed, the doctor replied. A standard operating table wouldn't do for such a special patient. I have nowhere to place the restraints, you see. I will have to make do with the floor. Ferdinand, my bag, if you please. The giant rushed to his side, dropping the bag at his feet. If he dies, then can I eat it? He asked, shifting from one foot to the other like a child asking a parent for a second helping of ice cream. If I am unable to save the patient, which I do deem unlikely, then... Yes, you may help me dispose of the remains, the doctor relented, but I do not hope it comes to that. 
He pressed a hand to his beak in deep thought for a moment, before opening his bag and pulling out a syringe filled with clear liquid. To begin, we must sedate the patient. He had no way to find a vein, and so he plunged the needle into the nearest section of the creature's soft surface, injecting a dose of sedative. Then he waited. The oozing motion of the entity slowed and stopped. It lay there on the ground, a still mound of flesh save for the occasional expanding and contracting motion, almost as if it was breathing. Excellent. Now there was no risk of the patient fleeing the operating room mid-procedure. He could truly begin. It was an arduous process that took hours of effort, of taking small tissue samples, attempting to make incisions only for the flesh to fuse back together seconds after the scalpel was taken away. This was truly an advanced illness, unlike anything he had ever seen before. It was enough to make him question his abilities as a doctor, but he shook the thought away. Self-pity never helped anyone. After about eight hours of continuous work, he had a breakthrough, a solution he had created long ago. A thick, green liquid sealed in a dusty jar had a miraculous effect when dripped onto one of the tissue samples. The melted flesh reconstituted, became solid, and human again. Eureka! He cried out, unable to restrain the sudden joy that leaped into his heart. This could be it. Very carefully, he filled the dropper with the green liquid. If these initial trials had been successful, then perhaps he couldn't finish the thought. Best not to get ahead of himself. He crossed to his patient and slowly began to pour the solution over the creature's viscous surface. He watched as the flesh toughened, coming together into a surface resembling human skin. It was working. It was working. But then the creature began to quiver, shaking uncontrollably like a bowl of jelly in an earthquake. The surface rippled, and the doctor could hear a high-pitched whine filling the room. Then, with a wet pop, the patient exploded, sending chunks of flesh splattering all over the room, painting the walls and ceiling. The doctor cried out in shock and horror, and in spite of himself, fell to his knees in despair. He had been so close, but still, he had failed. And who could say when he would find another test subject? If he would ever find a cure, I'm afraid I do not know what to do now, the doctor admitted. Fernand sighed. The next several days passed in a haze. The doctor paced around his laboratory, mulling over his possible mistakes again and again. He had rushed the process, he was certain of that now. It was a novice mistake, the sort of thing he might have done a century or two ago. How could he have been so foolish? How could he have made that innocent pay the price for his own hubris? As the doctor locked himself away in his mind palace, Fernand occupied himself by practicing his favorite songs. Lord Blackwood rode on the massive man's shoulder as he sang through the opera Don Giovanni. I once saw a production of this at the Teatro La Fenice in Venice, Lord Blackwood interjected his rhinopores twitching in delight at the memory. Marvelous production, marvelous city. I was there hunting a rogue tatzel worm wrecking havoc through the canals. I nearly lost my life on that voyage. Would you all be quiet for once in your miserable lives? A voice hissed from the shadows. There in the doorway, its face fixed in a frown, was the possessive mask. Black slime dripped from its eye holes, spilling down onto the plastic mannequin body it had taken hold of. Listening to you both is worse than being locked in that infernal box. The mask looked around the room, searching for someone. Where is the good doctor? It asked, voice dripping with disdain. Still moping about, counting his failures. Ignore him, my fine fellow. Lord Blackwood whispered to Fernand. Only those with weak constitutions and no achievements of their own spend their days dragging others down. When you have lived as long as I, you will learn this. <laughs> Careful, my lord. I'll stop by the kitchen and find some salt to pour on you. If you wish to fight me, then challenge me to a fair duel like a man. The colorful slug bellowed. Drawn by the sudden shouting, the doctor walked into the room. What is all this commotion? Oh, oh good. good. The mask clapped its plastic hands together, its face warping back into an eerie smile. There you are. This has all been so dreadfully boring. I came to see the remnants of your greatest shame. 
Are there still bloodstains on the floor in your pathetic little laboratory? You are a villain, the doctor seethed. Uncomfortable with the air of conflict in the room, Ferdinand and Lord Blackwood quickly exited to find another space where they could sing and share stories in peace. I simply speak the truths no one wants to hear. The mask crossed to the doctor's side with a series of light, dance-like steps that made the mannequin body creak. In fact, I have quite a few truths to share today. I've been outside, you see. Whatever's become of the sun only affects organic beings, and so... He gestured from his ceramic face to his plastic body. I am quite safe from its rays. You've been... Outside, the doctor couldn't keep the curiosity out of his voice. He was a scientist after all. Why, yes. Would you like to know what I've seen? Black slime dripped from the mask's mouth, pooling on the floor with a sizzling sound. I'm in no mood for tricks, the doctor warned. The mask held up his hands in mock surrender. No, no tricks, tricks, doctor. But if you'd rather take your chances outside and see for yourself, I can take my leave now. No, the doctor shook his head. Please, do tell me. It's so much worse than you could even imagine. The mask's words were bleak, but its tone was gleeful. Everywhere you look out there, the light has made monsters. Humans, dogs, cats, mice, the wild beasts of the forest, all melted down into creatures you would not even recognize. But that isn't all. No, that is not all. There are massive beasts, ten feet tall or more, made from dozens and dozens of the creatures coming together. They fuse and meld into one giant entity roving the streets in search of more and more bodies to add to the pile, an oozing, gaping maw of hunger and hate that seeks only to consume and destroy. It calls out to surviving humans in the voices of their fallen loved ones, tugs at their heartstrings to lure them out of their hiding places, and then it wraps around them with fleshy tentacles, pulling them in until they are no more. Just another part of the monster. Oh, Doctor, it's terror. It's an abomination. I could watch it all day. The Doctor wanted to believe the mask was lying, that it was trying to torment with him, with awful fabrications. But after all he had seen so far, he knew that its words were true. Get out of my sight, he said. Or what? The mask stared him down with its unmoving smile. I've seen what you do to your hosts, you know. Your body won't last forever, the doctor growled. Hmm, true. Maybe next I'll take yours. <laughs> the mask laughed a long, dark laugh of something ancient and evil. Then it turned and walked out the door, leaving the doctor alone. He spent so much of his time that way lately. His assistants were preoccupied. His former patients provided no real company, and so he did what he did best, carry on in solitude. He couldn't be sure how long he stood there in silence, thinking of what the mask told him. He knew it was dangerous outside, knew he was up against powerful destructive forces, but it was even worse than he had thought. What if the world was truly doomed? What if this was how it all ended? Not with a bang, but with a great melting. Suddenly, the doctor heard a sound he hadn't heard since the sun turned wrong. A scream. A human scream. Could it be? He had to see for himself. He grabbed his bag of tools and rushed down the hall, his robes fluttering behind him. There it was again. A different human voice, screaming in terror. As he grew closer to the sound, he could hear footsteps various other voices overlapping with each other. He rounded the corner, and there they were. A group of five humans, wrapped in tattered clothes, dirty and exhausted. Behind them was the entrance to what looked like a tunnel. Somehow they found a secret passage and made their way inside. Then he saw what made them scream. 
Clearly, these people were afraid and unaccustomed to the sight of a man of Ferdinand's stature, especially when the man was drooling and staring at them with hunger in his eyes. He would have to defuse the situation quickly. Hello, welcome. We mean you no harm, strangers. He stepped between Ferdinand and the humans. The man at the front of the group brandished a firearm, pointing the barrel directly at the doctor's beak. Please, sir, there is no need for violence. What are you? The man stammered. The other members of his party cowered behind him. An ally, if you will permit me to be. I'm a physician, you see, working on a cure for the condition that plagues the world. With a shaking hand, the man slowly lowered his gun. He did not put it away, though. You've figured out a cure for those things? I am in the process of developing it. So far, I have not been successful, but perhaps with your help? How do we know we can trust you? The man demanded. How am I supposed to know you're not part of this? Do you know who this man is? Fernand bellowed. This is Dr. John Watson, and I am Detective Sherlock Holmes, the greatest investigator in the world. There isn't a case we can't solve. The man looked at the woman next to him, and the two shared a wide-eyed glance. This, this guy's crazy, he whispered furtively. Put your weapon away, and we can speak more calmly, the doctor proposed. At this inopportune moment, a few of his revived patients shambled into view, and the man screamed again. This time he fired his weapon, shooting at one of the walking corpses. The bullets ricocheted off the walls, and several of the patients were hit. Please stop! With no other option, the doctor grabbed the man's arm, hoping to get a hold of the weapon and end the potential bloodshed. As soon as his gloved hand made contact, the man went limp and dropped to the ground with a hard thud. The woman next to him pulled him into her arms, checking his pulse. He's dead! She shrieked, tears streaming down her face. I... I am so sorry, my lady. I did not intend... She grabbed the man's gun and trained it on the doctor once more. You killed him! She cried. The other survivors were too shaken to speak, to move. One of them had his back turned to the group and was staring into the darkness behind him. Whatever he was looking at, it was worse than the chaos unfolding. But no one noticed the beige flesh tentacle snaking along the ground until it was too late. Until it had grabbed a hold of the man's ankle and dragged him into the tunnel with a shriek of pure, unadulterated terror. The woman nearly dropped her gun at the sound, whirling around to see what had happened. Deep in the tunnel, the scream warped into a wet gurgling sound. And then there was silence for a long moment. But then, something worse. A gooey, slimy sound. The sound of something enormous, something soft and fleshy, making its way through the tunnel and toward the group. Another tentacle curled around the edge of the opening, then another joined it. Something emerged that might have once been a hand, but it had melted into something unrecognizable. The monster emerged piece by piece until the doctor could see the entire thing. It looked like a heap of people, dozens of them clambering on top of each other, wrapping their limbs together until their flesh and insides emptied out and fused into a shapeless mass. It moved a bit like a giant slug, slimy and slow, but it seemed to know it could take its time. As the survivors scrambled back away from it, Ferdinand and the doctor taking a few steps back of their own, the sound of human voices filled the room. There were unintelligible whispers, the soft giggle of a child, a woman weeping. Come and be with us. A little boy's voice broke through the cacophony. Mommy, I miss you. Don't you miss me? The woman with the gun let out a broken sob. Billy? She sniffled. It's me, Mommy. The innocent voice continued, emanating from somewhere deep inside the monstrous mass that crept along the ground, swelling and grasping with its ropey tentacles. Come play with me outside. All you have to do is come outside. Madame, the creature is not who it claims to be. The doctor spoke up, and it seemed to shake the woman out of a trance. You're not my son. She hissed, squeezing the trigger and firing at the monster. The bullet made contact with a wet, useless slap and disappeared into the roving pile of the fallen. She fired again and again, but the monster did not stop. It did not even slow down. It lashed out with a tentacle that wrapped around her throat in a single fluid motion and snapped her neck with a crack. She fell to the ground and the tentacle pulled her into its depths until she was no longer visible. She hadn't been taken by the sun, not yet, but she was still lost. The rest of the survivors followed, their screams silenced one by one. The doctor felt the same overwhelming sense of hopelessness wash over him, the same shadow that had passed over him when he lost the last patient. What could he do? He was one physician against an overpowering force of destruction, perhaps 
he could touch it and it would fall dead like so many other organisms before. But what if it didn't? What if instead it wrapped around his body and squeezed the life from him? What if it carried him out into that cursed sunlight and he melted away like the others? He had to make a decision because the beast was advancing toward him. Doctor! Fernand shouted. It's going to destroy our facility! Indeed, the creature was flailing its appendages around, beating against the walls and trying to tear down steel and plaster, break down the shelter, until they too were exposed to the deadly light. I'm afraid this may be the end, my friend, the doctor lamented. I can see no hope for us now. No! Fernand shook his head. Let me save us. Let me lead it back outside. You'll be taken, the doctor cried. Perhaps not. I am a magnificent specimen after all. I believe I can withstand the sun and return to continue our work together. Fernand scooped his sleeping Lord Blackwood from his shoulder and placed him gingerly on a nearby shelf. Thank you for your company. Then he turned back to the doctor. And thank you for my freedom and your friendship. It has been an honor. Before the doctor could protest, Fernand was running, his thunderous steps pounding the earth as he led the monster in a chase. It took the bait, following this new large target back outside. He sealed off the tunnel behind them, ensuring the beast would not return the way it came. He wanted to believe Fernand's bravado, to think that the behemoth of a man had survived outside. But that night, he saw the great beast ooze past a window, and he could make out that familiar, wide, toothy grin protruding from its side. Just like that, the greatest assistant he had ever had was lost. Thank you for your service, my friend, he whispered to himself. I solemnly swear to you, your death shall not be in vain. Now first things first. Just in case you aren't yet familiar with SCP-049, otherwise known as the infamous Plague Doctor, then we're here to bring you up to speed. It'll help you get the most out of today's tale. SCP-049 is a tall humanoid entity, always seen wearing long black robes, a hood over its head, and a beaked mask protruding from underneath. The same kind of mask worn by physicians during the height of the Black Death. However, these parts of the Plague Doctor's attire aren't just a costume. The SCP Foundation discovered that all of SCP-049's outfit is actually part of his physical body. In other words, the robes, the hood, the mask, they are all made out of muscle and bone. The Plague Doctor's only real goal in life is to hunt down any person it deems to be infected. The entity often refers to something he calls the pestilence, and upon sensing this affliction in a human being, SCP-049 will attempt to make direct skin contact with whoever is apparently carrying said pestilence. The Plague Doctor's touch is lethal, killing anyone he comes into contact with. You might think that's as bad as it gets, that this creature just goes from person to person killing them via touch. But you would be wrong. It gets worse. Killing one of his victims is only the start. Afterwards, SCP-049 then begins performing a crude, outdated form of surgery, defiling and repurposing the person's corpse. Using equipment that he produces from his iconic doctor's bag, he injects a number of unknown chemicals into a person's carcass, eventually turning them into an instance of SCP-049-2. In essence, a vicious, incredibly aggressive zombie. The most bizarre part in SCP-049's mind, this means he's just cured you. Naturally, SCP-049 is already held in containment, safely locked away by the SCP Foundation. At present, SCP-049 resides in a humanoid holding cell, closely monitored by surveillance cameras for 24 hours a day, every single day. The SCP Foundation used to send its doctors and researchers into SCP-049's cell, or would make a habit of bringing him cadavers as test subjects, fresh bodies for the plague doctor to hone his surgical skills. The researchers would keenly observe the doctor transforming the dead into instances of SCP-049-2. But these researchers and doctors working for the Foundation weren't exactly free of disease, meaning every time they entered SCP-049's cell, they were at risk of receiving his deadly touch. In this cage with this deadly dangerous doctor that spends all his time in captivity, that's where our story starts. But while you might expect a story about the Plague Doctor to revolve solely around violence, disease, and death, 
This tale offers a surprising divergence. Boiled, scrambled, and fried is a story about an unexpected new life coming into existence in a frankly bizarre fashion. All starting in that tiny containment chamber where SCP-049 had been held since the Foundation first captured him. It had been increasingly obvious to the researchers observing him that something was quite wrong with the Plague Doctor. For the first time since the Doctor had arrived in the Foundation's custody, he appeared to have fallen ill unexpectedly. The security cameras that were trained on him day in and day out recorded SCP-049 groaning in pain clutching his stomach as he limped weakly around the confines of his cell. Had the pestilence finally gotten the better of the good doctor? Was he too now infected, the same as the world around him? The Foundation's medics were confused, baffled as to what could possibly be wrong with the creature. Of course, it would also have been easier to examine the doctor if they could easily touch him without the risk of dying, or if his body wasn't made of skin robes. Nonetheless, the Plague Doctor was brought to a medical station for a proper diagnosis, under the orders of one Dr. Richard Omel, a Foundation doctor who specialized in taking care of humanoid anomalies and who had been assigned as SCP-049's caretaker. The creature tried to assure Dr. Omel that he was strong enough to withstand the intense pain he was obviously suffering from. Putting on gloves for safety, Dr. Omel felt a distinct lump within SCP-049's stomach, initially believing it to be a case of abdominal distension. This is a condition that occurs when gases or fluids build up in the stomach and cause it to swell up and inflate, usually as a symptom of another internal disease. But SCP-049 reassured his caretaker that his condition wasn't the result of any disease, and in fact, it had even apparently happened before. Dr. Omel asked SCP-049 why he had never told the Foundation about this, or why the creature wouldn't explain what was happening. I did not think you would believe me, so I said nothing, SCP-049 explained. Doctor, I am pregnant. I'm sorry, but I can't explain it. Please, just let me return to my cell. I need to make the proper preparations. Naturally, this statement was met with stunned belief by Dr. Omel, especially seeing as the Foundation had been observing SCP-049 through security cameras for months on end without stopping. The creature couldn't explain, tensing up and breathing heavily due to suffering obvious and intense pain. As Dr. Omel rushed out to grab more members of medical staff, the Plague Doctor continued struggling against the aches, letting out his loudest of cries yet, as an extreme bout of agony surged through him. A pearly white egg gently tumbled out from SCP-049's robes just as Dr. Omel and a group of Foundation medics arrived, staring in shock at what had just happened. Seeming to recover quite quickly, the Plague Doctor asked to be unshackled and returned to his cell to tend to the egg worried it would die unless he was able to care for it. As the shocked Dr. Omel agreed, SCP-049 gently picked up the egg and cradled it in his arms. Of course, this all came as quite an unexpected turn of events to the Foundation. Reports were filed and archive entries had to be updated. But they allowed the Plague Doctor to keep his egg and raise it, perhaps just so they could watch and research as it happened instead of out of any sense of kindness. For the next five days, the creature was fixated entirely on caring for the egg. All his energy focused on it. He built a nest in the corner of his containment cell, out of fabric and paper, and would sit on the egg in order to keep it warm. During that time, a number of Foundation researchers assigned to watch over SCP-049 reported that they had heard clucking noises coming through the speakers in the observation room. Now assigned to watch and report on SCP-049's progress, Dr. Omel watched the Plague Doctor from the observation room connected to the cameras and audio recording devices in the creature's cell. Ever since the bizarre and unanticipated birth, Omel had been given the task of compiling an extensive report on everything that took place within the cell. For the most part, everything seemed fine, or as fine as something so unusual could seem. The egg was in a healthy condition nonetheless, although the whole event had the Foundation doctor wondering. SCP-049 had always had a somewhat bird-like appearance, helped in no small part by that infamous beak-shaped mask. Did the fact that this creature could apparently lay eggs mean that the Plague Doctor was some form of humanoid bird, an avian-human hybrid that only mimicked the Plague Doctors of old? Or had those medieval physicians created their masks to emulate SCP-049? Which had come first, the Plague Doctors or THE Plague Doctor? 
a debate as confusing and cyclical as the one about the chicken or the egg. And now the plague doctor also had an egg. I don't know about you, but I'm starting to get a headache just thinking about it. SCP-049 had begun to softly peck at the surface of the egg, when Dr. O'Mell decided to step in and look for some answers to his burning questions. Over the speakers in 049's cell, he asked for an explanation. The plague doctor answered that he was checking his egg for signs of life within its shell, as if that answer should have been obvious. And he had succeeded. There was definitely something living inside. As the plague doctor returned to sitting atop the egg, Omel asked outright if SCP-049 was, in fact, a bird. It was uncommon, if not downright unheard of, for a humanoid anomaly to lay eggs like this. After a moment's thought, SCP-049 replied with, No, as far as I'm aware, I have never been a bird. Yet, producing eggs is natural to me. He explained that while this had happened before, it had been at least a few decades since the last time. Then the plague doctor went back to sitting on his egg, humming as it rocked back and forth in the nest. Ten days passed after the egg had first arrived, and now SCP-049 cell was brimming with activity. Foundation personnel had fitted the room with a glass screen to protect them from the plague doctor, with researchers piling in into the safe side, carrying cameras and hurriedly taking notes, protected by a number of guards. The big day had seemingly arrived. Whatever had been brimming and brewing inside the egg was about to hatch. As the researchers all whispered to each other with excitement and intrigue, SCP-049 stood protectively on the other side of the room, just waiting in fascinated expectation. The pearlescent egg started to shake suddenly, its pale surface cracking. The crack spread from the center of the egg, forking across the shell like a lightning bolt over a dark, cloudy sky. Something underneath was pushing through, pressing outwards from within the egg, splitting it apart as it had tapped and pecked its way to freedom. A small white beak poked a hole through the shell that surrounded it, piercing the egg at last. The creature within, this spawn of the Plague Doctor, began to tear itself through the barrier that had kept it safe from the outside world until it was ready to take its first steps. With both arms, the thing tore itself out of the egg, all under the watch of the Foundation's doctors and researchers who were stunned to see another Plague Doctor emerging from the egg. It was small, much smaller than the father that had birthed it and cared for it while it was waiting to hatch. But it was nonetheless a perfect miniature version of SCP-049, complete with the same kind of robes, the same beaked mask, even with a little hat on top of its head. With a gasp of pure excitement, the original Plague Doctor lifted up his new mini-self and hugged the child in his arms. The excitement that had filled the room up now quickly dissipated, as the audience of Foundation personnel quickly realized that they had just witnessed the live birth of a brand new anomaly, of which they understood virtually nothing. As Dr. O'Mell stepped forward to cautiously ask SCP-049 to put down its offspring, the smaller Plague Doctor smacked O'Mell's hand with a stick, before leaping from its father's arms and dashing out of the cell. As alarms began to blare, indicating a breach in containment, SCP-049 wiped a tear from his eyes, stating, He is the cure. The new smaller plague doctor, now designated as SCP-049-J, seems to have a talent for evading capture by the Foundation, and for frequently escaping containment. Unlike its predecessor, SCP-049, this offspring has a body beneath its robes that is composed mostly of moss, wads of tissue, and smaller plague doctor masks. During the occasions in which it has been successfully detained by the Foundation, SCP-049-J has claimed that it is in fact a powerful magical doctor and wizard, with the ability to cure all that ails mankind. However, to date, it has been unable to cure anything, usually making medical conditions actively worse. When you reach a certain level of wealth, you start to feel like nothing can touch you. You spit sunshine and crap gold. At least that's been my experience. Can't imagine any of you can relate. But please allow me to explain how it feels when there's three commas in your bank balance. I know time is money, but don't worry. I'm good for it. Or at least I thought I was. Before that night. Point is, the more money you get, the higher you climb that golden ladder, the stronger the feeling of security gets. Money can't buy happiness, or so the saying goes, but trust me when I say that it can buy everything else. And that's pretty close. That's right, I'm one of the dreaded 1%. A straight up billionaire, baby. Don't get me wrong, I'm not some guy who was born with a silver spoon in my mouth. I worked hard, 
I was lucky, of course, and I had some help from my parents, but who didn't get a little help from their families while growing up? After my dad helped me get into an Ivy League school and gave me a $20 million loan as a graduation present, I was completely on my own. I scraped and I saved and I turned that loan into the biggest tech conglomerate in the entire world. After I made my first hundred million, I stopped worrying about being successful enough, driven enough, good enough. After my first billion? <laughs> I felt like I could do anything. And honestly, I could. The money stopped feeling real, stopped being anything except a number ticking ever upward, and signifying that I would never run out of points in the game of life. I'd won. I purchased myself a rocket with a velvet interior for luxury space travel. I filled a room in my house with vintage guitars that had all previously been touched by members of the Beatles just because I could. I moved into a cottage in Tuscany, a house in Martha's Vineyard, a beach house in Hawaii, my Los Angeles mansion, and my favorite, a villa in the south of France. That's not all of them, of course, but those are my top five. If you ever get the chance to have a house on every continent, I highly recommend it. <laughs> Just kidding, I know most people won't get the chance. But maybe if you're lucky, you'll get an invitation to one of my legendary parties. If you're luckier than lucky, you'll find yourself with an invitation to my annual costume party. It is an incredible spectacle every year, and this year was no exception. Picture it. Me, my beautiful wife, and international supermodel, thank you very much, and a few hundred of our closest friends gathered at my house nestled right up against the French Riviera. The theme was masquerade ball, and the dress code was strict. No one would be admitted without a mask or attire elegant enough for the party. Inside, what greeted them was nothing short of absolute opulence. I instructed my party planner to spare no expense. The ballroom was outfitted with a massive Swarovski chandelier, thousands of candles lighting the room, flames sparkling in the crystal and filling the room with warm light. In the corner, a string quartet borrowed from the National Opera of Paris played next to one of the six, count them, six champagne fountains. I commissioned a portrait of me and my wife dressed to the nines and wearing our masks, and hung it in the entryway to greet my guests. In the dining room, guests could sit down to a feast fit for Louis XIV, complete with 30 courses including pheasant, pâté, poached pears, whole roasted boar, and other dishes inspired by the Palace of Versailles. For partygoers with more modern palates, the molecular gastronomy room was open with the chef on site to serve flavored foams and vaporized cocktails, or those who wanted to stick to the ballroom could enjoy the passed around hors d'oeuvres. But really, why choose? If they wanted, they could have a bit of everything, or a lot of it. Money was truly no object. The party was going great. I was wearing my favorite suit, which cost more than most people spend on a house, and a custom-designed mask made from hundreds of black and white diamonds, with a few red diamonds thrown in for a pop of color. And because they're the rarest variety of diamond in the world, the more you know, right? My guests had all arrived, and guards were stationed at all entrances to make sure no party crashers tried to make their way inside and take advantage of my hospitality and generosity. So imagine my surprise when, long after the guest list had been completely checked off, a mysterious figure swept in and interrupted everything. My wife elbowed me in the side as I was helping myself to some beluga caviar. Who is that? She hissed to me, tilting her head towards the doorway at the other end of the ballroom. I turned, expecting to see a foreign dignitary or an oil baron she had forgotten the name of, but instead I saw something much more bizarre. There, standing like a shadow in the room, full of silk and gold, was a person dressed in thick black robes. They were wearing a mask, but it was unsettling to look at. Intense, dark eyes peered out of the pale ceramic that tapered into a long, pointed beak. I dimly remember drawings of medieval doctors wearing masks like those as the Black Plague decimated Europe. This was just some edgy party crasher looking for attention. I knew that, but looking at them, a chill ran up my spine. How did he get in? I shook my head, motioning to one of the security guards stationed near the entrance. Do your job, fellas, come on. Rob, my beefiest guard, got the signal and approached the crasher. I took a sip of my drink, eager to watch this wannabe cool guy get booted from my world. He watched Rob come closer as he stood completely still, little black eyes unblinking. What was this guy's deal? He reached out one black-gloved hand and touched Rob's throat with one finger. As soon as the stranger touched his skin, Rob dropped to the ground, unmoving. He was all the way on the other side of the room, but somehow I just knew he was dead. As soon as Rob fell, the party came to a screeching halt. My wife screamed and tugged on my arm, but I couldn't take a step. I just watched frozen in place as the stranger in the plague doctor mask pulled a syringe from a pocket in his robes and injected something thick and black into Rob's corpse. 
What had just been a mound of dead flesh began to thrash around, hands grasping at nothing, legs kicking, and something that looked like Rob, but was definitely not him, climbed to its feet. It had his face, his body, but its eyes were hollow and dead. There was no light behind them. They were just flat. The thing that once was Rob began to shuffle into the room, the stranger trailing behind it. As he walked, he touched guests with his gloved hands. Like Rob, they dropped to the ground, dead at a single touch. Guests began to scatter in every direction, running for their lives. Still, I couldn't get myself to move. A dozen people were dead on the floor, then two dozen, then three. As he walked, the stranger injected them with more of the strange liquid, and the dead guests shambled to their feet or dragged themselves along the floor with stiff, pale fingers. The shuffling corpses that were once my friends grabbed guests near them with inhuman strength as they tried to run away, dragging them toward the horrible doctor so he could kill and transform them too. I had to make a break for it. I had to get out of there, but my legs wouldn't listen to me. Fear and morbid curiosity froze me to the spot. There had to be at least 50 zombies by now, and the doctor just kept going. He was getting closer and closer to me, hand outstretched and ready to deliver its deadly touch. I unstuck my tongue from the roof of my mouth, swallowed and spoke. Why are you doing this? The doctor paused, tilting his head to the side and thought. This home is overrun with the pestilence. It is my duty to contain its spread and treat the infected. He spoke formally, in a voice that reverberated from inside the mask with a metallic edge. They must be cured. I had to think fast. I could talk my way out of this. I've sold companies, made mergers, avoided paying taxes my whole life. Now I just had to negotiate for my own life. My friends might be gone, but I at least could save myself. You're, you're a doctor, I said. He seemed pleased at this. I am a physician, yes, he said. You're trying to help, I continued. Yes, I see you too are a man of science. He had stopped coming closer. The zombies had stopped advancing on me. It was working. I don't know if you're aware of this, but I am a very wealthy man, doctor. I took a drink of my champagne, doing my best to appear casual, friendly even. I'm sure you're in need of funding for your mission. Perhaps we could work together. You wish to aid me in my mission, the doctor asked. I do, I lied. I'm in great health, as you can see, but I don't want a pestilence spreading around and infecting me or my loved ones. I'd like to help you. I pause, searching for the right words. I could be your patron. The doctor clapped his gloved hands together, and I could have sworn he smiled beneath his beaked visage. Excellent! This is the most fortuitous meeting indeed. I am glad to have found you here, sir. If you would come with me, we may begin our work. He turned and swept out of the room, gesturing for me to follow. I looked around for an exit route, a way to make a break for it, but there were too many corpses ready to grab me with inhuman strength and drag me to certain death. The room was filled with them, shuffling about in their torn formal wear, slackened jaws hanging loose and hollow eyes watching me. I had no choice but to follow this guy and just wait for my opportunity to get away. I don't know how long we walked down the narrow town streets in the dark. Every time we passed an alley I thought I could duck down, the doctor got closer to me with his deadly hands, or a group of zombies encircled me. I was outside. I should have been home free, but there was nowhere to run. Eventually, the doctor stopped in front of an abandoned, dilapidated house. The paint was peeling off the walls, and there was a hole that rotted through the ceiling. Welcome, sir, to my laboratory. He made a grand, sweeping gesture, inviting me to walk through the door. I obeyed, crossing the threshold. The smell of rot and dried blood hit me so hard that I thought I might throw up. The house was dark. I had to squint to see, but I could make out scattered piles of body parts, animal and human. There was a table covered with surgical equipment, and next to it, a black leather doctor's bag. There were people in here too, or they used to be people. They were silent zombies, like the others. Some stood along the walls at silent attention, others were lying on the ground hooked up to IVs full of strange liquid, or strapped to gurneys ready to be operated on. Uh, <laughs> this, this looks great. My voice shook, but I hoped he wouldn't notice. Uh, with my funds, we can upgrade your lab, get you to a more high-tech facility, better lighting, more space, research assistance. Excellent. Together, we will eradicate the pestilence once and for all. There. The doctor pointed at the medical table to my right. Grab a pair of gloves and slide them on. The doctor nodded as I squeezed my hands into a pair of rubber medical gloves. Absolutely. Can you show me more of what you're working on? Good thinking. 
When his back was turned, I would run out the door and get to safety. The doctor approached the table covered with tools and bent to pick up a scalpel. Now was my moment. I ran toward the door as fast as my legs would carry me. I collided with something hard and cold. It was Rob, my old bodyguard, doing what he did best, keeping the perimeter secure. Sir, where are you going? The doctor called. Are you trying to abandon our work? He paused for a moment, realizing what I had done. Did you deceive me? His voice turned cold, angry. No, 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 I... I couldn't come up with a lie. Rob wrapped his arms around my chest, holding me in place as the doctor approached me with the scalpel in hand. You are not looking well, my friend. Perhaps you have fallen ill. Such a shame. I look forward to our collaboration. He drew the scalpel, stretching his hand out towards my neck. I thrashed around, arms flailing and grabbing at his mask with gloved hands. What did this monster look like underneath? Who was he? What was he? The mask did not budge, and I realized this was no mask. It was his face. Don't worry. His blade sliced into the side of my neck. I will make you well again. His pitch black eyes twinkled as he set to work. Then everything went dark. Glass shatters. A D-class screams. The shill cry of an alarm sounds. There's been a containment breach at the SCP Foundation. Somehow the Plague Doctor has escaped his cell and is making a break for it. Against all odds, he finds the exit, and he's out. He's free. He's on the lam. But how long can he elude the Foundation's attempts to track him down and recontain him at any cost? It will take all of his cunning, his intellect, and his strange anomalous abilities, but he's going to try and hold on to his newfound freedom as tightly as he can. I'm getting ahead of myself here, though. Let's start at the beginning. Day 1. SCP-049, or the Plague Doctor, may be an esoteric anomaly whose grasp of medicine is practically medieval, but he's still a doctor. He didn't get this far by not paying attention to his surroundings. So when an unexpected power outage triggered by an experiment gone wrong somewhere in the bowels of Site-19 gave him the chance to escape captivity, well, he took it. The Foundation had recently revoked his access to live experimental subjects again, and he had had enough. It was time to seize the moment and make a mad dash for freedom. With the security system down, the doctor broke open the door to his cell, grabbed his trusty apothecary bag, and ran into the hall. Guards were already swarming, ready to drag him back into captivity, but he had planned ahead. Swiftly, he uncorked a glass bottle of silvery liquid, spilling it onto the floor, where it began to eat away at the tile, the shoes of the guards, and if they maintained contact for too long, the soles of their feet. This bought him just enough time to keep running. The sounds of screaming down another hall and the raucous laughter of one Dr. Jack Bright signaled to the doctor that most of the Foundation staff were otherwise occupied. With this in mind, he sprinted on, letting his chitinous body carry him to the exit. Then for the first time in far too long, fresh air on his beak, the sun in his eyes, the scent of cut grass and damp leaves from the last night's rain, the world was here, waiting for him just as he had left it. Of course, the world was still very much in danger. He hadn't just broken free for himself, but to address the pestilence head on as best as he could. But for now, as he heard the sound of the alarm, the guards gaining on him, he had to prioritize his own safety first. He had to hide. Day 2 he ran for ages. He couldn't be quite sure how long as he had no way to measure the passage of time except the position of the sun in the sky. It set, it rose, bathing the countryside in soft yellow light and set again, plunging the land into darkness, all while he continued to run. Then finally, the plague doctor stopped. He had found a farm. There was a little farmhouse, but he did not dare disturb the sleeping family and alarm them. Instead, he turned to the barn for shelter. He let himself in, tiptoed past the horses as they slept there, and made himself a bed from straw and a burlap sack. From his bag, he pulled a pillow and a little spray bottle. He misted the pillow with a lavender-scented oil and finally allowed himself a moment to rest. 
He did not need to sleep like ordinary men, but after such a long journey, he could get pretty close. Day 3 The morning of the Plague Doctor's third day of freedom began with the high-pitched whinny of a terrified horse and the frantic stamping of hooves. The doctor opened his eyes to the sight of one of the horses, now awake and not at all happy to see a stranger in its barn, making its fear and displeasure known. Buttercup? A man called from outside the barn. That you, girl? What's got you spooked? The door to the barn creaked open, and before the doctor could do anything, he was face to face with the farmer who owned the land. Who are you? What are you doing in my barn? The man demanded. Good sir, I apologize for the intrusion. I am but a humble traveler seeking shelter. You need to get out of here and stop scaring my horses now. Don't make me come back with my shotgun. No need for that sort of thing. I, I, I will be on my way. The doctor collected his things and decided to spare the old farmer rather than use more extreme methods to change his mind. He left the barn in a hurry. Day 4. Day 4. With the farm far behind him, the plague doctor trudged along on his journey, always keeping an eye out for unmarked vans and armed guards. So far though, he was safe. He hadn't had a spare moment to return to his experiments though, which was beginning to wear on him. The work was what had motivated him to break out in the first place, and now he wasn't sure when he would be able to make time for it. Cruel irony, indeed. But then, as if his silent prayer had been answered, he heard a peculiar sound coming from the woods, just off the dirt road he was walking down. A sickly bray from an injured animal, a poor soul in need, a patient. He followed the sound to its source. A deer lay on its side, clearly sick or injured somehow. Do not be afraid, my friend, the doctor said softly. You are sick, but I can make you well. He sat his bag down on the grass and got to work. First, he touched the deer with a gloved hand, stopping its heart and putting it out of its misery. Then he reached into his bag for his trusty tools and some of his best medicines. In no time at all, the deer was reanimated, cured, walking around again like new. Sure, it was a little bit different, stumbling a bit, and each eye looking in a different direction, but the doctor considered the treatment a success. A day well spent. Day 5 The next day, feeling reinvigorated after his successful encounter with the deer, the plague doctor began his quest for shelter anew. He walked for most of the day until, as the sun was setting, he came upon something curious. A house, dilapidated looking, with a large sign out front reading, House of Horrors, enter if you dare. Though he didn't know it, the doctor had stumbled upon the local town's premier seasonal haunted house attraction. To him, it was simply an empty house he could take up residence inside. He was curious and a bit perplexed as he walked past plastic skeletons, animatronic werewolves that popped out from behind styrofoam tombstones, and giant fake spiders and cotton cobwebs. None of the fake monsters gave him trouble, so though he was confused by what he saw, he continued to explore the house. Then he found something incredible, a laboratory. There was a long stainless steel table with a mannequin strapped to it. A row of prop surgical tools sat on a train next to the mannequin, and along the back shelf were rows and rows of jars filled with liquids that looked like something the play doctor himself would pull out of his bag. He couldn't believe his eyes. After wandering aimlessly for days, he found the perfect place, almost as if it had been made just for him. Of course, it wasn't. It was for the paying customers who would be coming to the haunted house the next day, along with the actors hired to perform inside, but he didn't need to know any of that yet. He replaced the jars with his own and the tools with functioning ones, with the exception of the plastic body on the table, which he privately wished was a real human subject. This was absolutely perfect. Day 6 the haunt actors showed up for work and were surprised to find a new guy had beat them there, and he was already in costume. They shrugged it off. They were making minimum wage, and that wasn't enough to ask any questions. They were there to suit up and get spooky, and that was it. They did appreciate his Plague Doctor costume, though. It was much higher budget than anything they had. Did you make that get up yourself? Asked a friendly zombie. Indeed I did, the doctor replied cheerfully, happy to finally encounter a group of individuals who were unafraid of him. Nice, bro. The zombie gave him a thumbs up, and if the plague doctor could, with his rigid beaked face, he would have smiled. These new colleagues were a bit unusual looking, with their ghostly white faces, vampire fangs, green tinged makeup, and excess fur, but their kindness was encouraging. 
Meanwhile, the haunt actors were gossiping amongst themselves, wondering where the new Plague Doctor character came from, who approved it, who hired this guy, why was he doing that accent? Whatever he was, whatever, he was plenty scary and nice enough guy to get to work with. So Frankenstein's monster let the Plague Doctor have the laboratory set and moved himself into the graveyard. The customers loved him too, shrieking with delight as he welcomed them into his laboratory, asking if any of them would like to volunteer to be a test subject. Lucky for them, they had already been warned not to touch any of the actors while walking through the attraction. As his first night at his unintentional job came to a close, the Plague Doctor's new friends bid him farewell. We're gonna go to a bar up the road for a couple drinks, the ghostly bride said. Wanna come? Ah, no time for revelry, the Plague Doctor replied. I must attend to my work. Take care, the woman just laughed. Okay, see you later. And so the Plague Doctor spent his night in the haunted house again, tinkering with his tools and his tissue samples, listening to the royalty-free scary music tape play again and again on repeat into the night. Day 7 The next day, attendance at the haunted house was slow. The actors with little to do spent their time scrolling aimlessly on their phones, filming joke videos for social media, and pranking each other. One of them got the bright idea to pull a prank on the new hire, the stranger that none of them knew much about. He would have a friend turn out the lights in the laboratory, and when the lights were turned back on, he would have replaced the mannequin on the table. He couldn't have known what would happen. All he wanted to do was startle the new guy, freak him out with the sight of an unexpected werewolf on his operating table. And it was effective. Sort of. The Plague Doctor froze in place when the lights went out calling, Hello? What is happening? And when the room was illuminated once more, he took in the sight of the living being on the operating table. My friend, you've come to me for treatment? The werewolf started to get up, disappointed he hadn't managed to elicit a scream, but the plague doctor reached out a hand to stop him, and that was curtains for that particular actor. As soon as the plague doctor's gloved hand made contact with the man in the werewolf costume, his heart stopped. Oh dear, the plague doctor remarked. Do not fear, I have the cure, you'll be alright in no time at all. By the time the rest of the actors came to see what had happened to the werewolf, there was a real zombie in the haunted house. Then, it was pure chaos. Actors running and screaming, knocking over props and abandoning their seasonal gig, darting between customers as they went, shrieking, Don't go in there! It's real! Naturally, this only made them want to check it out even more, but by the time they got inside, there was no sign of the Plague Doctor. Only one very lost zombie in a werewolf costume, a few jars broken in all the chaos, and footsteps in the dry grass outside, leaving town. Days 8 to 18 The Plague Doctor spent all of his eighth day on the run, walking once more. He was starting to get used to this, the endless drudgery of the path to freedom. He hated to admit it, but he was almost starting to miss his cell back at the foundation, the routine of it, the quiet time to work, the three meals given to him each day, even though he didn't need to eat to survive. He missed food and drink, the simple pleasures of bread, meat, cheese, fruit, a mug of tea, a cup of wine. He sighed to himself wistfully. Then he caught a whiff of something lovely, he lifted his beak, taking in another deep breath. The unmistakable scent of roast pheasant, hearty and warm. Beneath it, something else. Mulled wine, spiced and inviting. Smells that reminded him of home, of days long lost. He couldn't be certain where it would lead, or if there would be a seat for him at the table, but he couldn't resist following the heavenly aroma to its source. As he drew closer to the smell of food and merriment, he could hear music the plucking of a lyre, the high trill of a flute, singing and clapping. Then he finally spotted it. Rows of colorful tents, long banquet tables, minstrels wandering about and playing ballads to anyone who would listen, men, women, and children frolicking in elaborate costumes, plate armor, robes, gowns, and more. Though the plague doctor didn't know how to describe what he was seeing, he had wandered onto the site of one of the state's largest renaissance fairs. It just so happened to be opening day, and he was just in time for the celebratory feast. Good day, Doctor. A nobleman tipped his hat to SCP-049. Are you speaking to me? The Plague Doctor was taken aback by the recognition. Why, of course. You're the only Doctor I see. Her Majesty the Queen thanks you for your service, for keeping us all safe from the Great Plague. The Plague Doctor had no idea that this man was an actor, playing along with him in what he assumed was a scene for the tourists. 
Instead, he took the words to heart, swelling with pride and gratitude for the recognition. Good sir, it is my duty and my honor. The plague doctor nodded politely. Luckily for him, and unbeknownst to the rest of the cast of players at the fair, the man originally hired to play the town plague doctor had booked a commercial role that morning and decided not to go in to work. The man's choice not to call and let anyone know, though rude, led to a fortuitous misunderstanding for SCP-049. Please, join us at the royal table. The nobleman made a sweeping gesture with his arm, inviting the doctor to sit and dine with him and the rest of the actors playing members of the court. Thank you for your kindness. If he could, the plague doctor would have smiled. He dined to his heart's content that afternoon, listening to sounds of music and laughter. He slotted into his role at the fair even better than his position at the haunted house. He answered questions from tourists about his work as a physician, warned them of the dangers of the great pestilence, and posed for the occasional photograph. He spent a wonderful ten days living in a stylized artificial version of the past, basking in the warm glow of camaraderie. Though the other actors wondered why he never took his mask off, even to eat. Then, sadly, it was time for the fair to pack up for the season. The plague doctor bid his new friends farewell, and declined their offers to exchange numbers and keep in touch. He would, however, always remember them fondly. Days 19 through 41. As he was departing the fairgrounds, the doctor caught a glimpse of strange men approaching some of the actors, showing federal badges and asking them questions. He couldn't be certain that it was the foundation but it was more than enough to make him cautious. He would have to retreat into the woods once more and stay out of sight. He laid low for quite some time, for 22 days to be exact. But then, on day 41, day 41 to 52, it started to snow. White blanketed the forest floor, soft and cold. The weather wouldn't kill him, of course, but it was uncomfortable. He would need to find some more efficient shelter to escape from the elements before the winter storm worsened. He trudged through the snow into a new town, small and quaint. There was an abandoned church at the edge of the main road, a bit broken down, but the roof held firm against the onslaught of ice and wind. So the plague doctor made it his new home for the next 12 days, working quietly and staying out of sight. Day 53 to 57. On the eve of the plague doctor's 53rd day on the run from the SCP Foundation, he was stirred from his work by the sound of a choir of beautiful voices outside. He looked to find a group of Christmas carolers singing together, the rows of houses along the streets covered in colorful lights and glittering decorations. Wanting to get a little closer to the music, the doctor left his hiding spot for the first time in nearly two weeks. But as the choir saw a strangely shaped dark shadow emerging from the abandoned church, they screamed and scattered in every direction. One of them yelled something about the Krampus as they went. Frightened by the whole interaction, SCP-049 found himself a new spot under a bridge. It was cold but isolated. At least it was for five days. Day 58 On day 58, a group of local teenagers, rowdy and looking to make some trouble, spotted the plague doctor squatting under the bridge. They pelted him with snowballs, laughing. Before he could do anything about it, fortunately for the teens, they then ran back to their car and sped away. Drenched in ice and cold water, miserable and irritated, the plague doctor searched for another place to stay. Day 59 to Day 84 The plague doctor was able to slip into another relatively quiet building, the local community theater, which happened to be an old opera house repurposed as the site of volunteer-run musicals. While the townsfolk began rehearsals for their production of The Phantom of the Opera, the plague doctor watched from above, hiding in the shadows. Every so often, the stagehand would catch a glimpse of a cape, the silhouette of a face, a pair of dark eyes, but no one believed her when she tried to tell them that the phantom was real. At least until a handyman went up into the rafters to install some lights and saw the plague doctor for himself. Then it was time for him to flee to a new town. Day 85 to Day 89 On Day 85, the plague doctor climbed up onto the roof of a dark house to avoid a particularly aggressive dog and let himself in through the attic window. The next morning, a little girl came up into the attic in search of a lost toy and found him there. He waited for her to scream, but she didn't. She introduced herself as Abby and asked if he would like some cookies and milk. He accepted her gracious offer, and the two visited with each other for several days until Abby's parents asked who she was talking to. They didn't take it well when she answered, the Birdman in the attic. Day 90 
On day 90, Abby's parents called the police, who had been warned to look out for a man in a bird mask, and got in touch with their contacts at the SCP Foundation. Feeling the authorities closing in, SCP-049 took to the wilderness once more. Day 91 to Day 99 Though the air was still painfully cold, the plague doctor managed to set up camp, using tools from his bag to build a fire and construct a makeshift tent. He stayed there for three days, before intending to move on and throw the foundation off of his trail, but he was slowed by the appearance of a group of hikers, bundled up against the winter weather and exploring the woods. Afraid he couldn't trust them, the doctor touched one to convince him to leave. The man fell to the ground dead, and as his companions ran away screaming, the doctor vowed to cure him. Working against the inopportune conditions, it took him five more days to reanimate the hiker. On day 100 of his time on the lam, the foundation finally closed in. The plague doctor was just stitching up a large incision in his patient's chest when he heard the click of a gun behind him. Come with us peacefully, and we won't have to sedate you, the officer said. With a heavy sigh, the plague doctor held up his hands, stepping back from his patient just as its undead body sat up, blinking its unseeing eyes. Very well, I will go back. To tell you the truth, gentlemen, this has all been a bit too much trouble. I could use the rest. There are many mysteries locked within the walls of the SCP Foundation. From potentially world-ending scenarios to the minds of monsters, like the hard-to-destroy reptile. Day after day, the research staff work tirelessly to unravel these secrets, contain them, and, when necessary, terminate them. But what about another researcher? Another man of science trying desperately to uncover the truth? Today, we'll put down the clipboards and white lab coats in favor of black robes, a beaked mask, or rather, skull, and a seemingly endless doctor's bag to take a look at the average day for one peculiar physician, SCP-049, the Plague Doctor. We took the liberty of turning the researcher into the research subject, watching SCP-049 as he went about his daily life. From his inscrutable experiments to his strange habits, it was difficult to chronicle without tipping the good doctor off as to what we were up to, but we were able to get everything we needed to make the video you're watching right now. Welcome, friends, enemies, and future patients to a day in the life of SCP-049. 6 AM. The great dying never sleeps, and neither really does the plague doctor. Unlike ordinary human doctors, he does not need to get his eight hours of shut-eye in order to function properly. The sharp mind of SCP-049 never dulls, no matter how long he is awake. Of course, he does occasionally lie down in his containment cell, arms crossed over his chest like a mummy, breathing at a noticeably slower pace for several hours. However, he does not appear to actually enter a REM cycle, nor does his behavior change when he is denied this rest time. It would appear he is simply, for lack of a better term, brainstorming for a little while before getting up to start the new day. Back when he lived on the outside, he would rise to the sound of a rooster's crow or the ringing of church bells in the town square. But now, we discovered, the plague doctor becomes active for the day at exactly 6 a.m. on the dot. We're not sure how he manages such precision since there are no clocks visible from his room, but then again, there's a lot we still don't understand about him. But whether you wake to the sound of a buzzing phone alarm or your own perfectly tuned internal clock, there's nothing wrong with getting a nice early start on your day's tasks. Just like he doesn't need sleep, the Plague Doctor does not rely on steady caloric intake for his energy. Instead, he is sustained by the satisfaction of doing what needs to be done. But that doesn't mean he can't eat. He enjoys starting the day with breakfast, often consisting of toasted bread with butter, jam, or honey. If he's feeling particularly indulgent, sometimes all three, and he washes it down with an espresso or a cup of steaming hot lavender tea. Though he's a serious man, he understands the importance of treating yourself first thing in the morning. It sets the tone for the day and gives him the boost he'll need for what's to come. 8 AM. Some people enjoy a long, languid morning routine. They shower, they do their 11-step skincare regimen, they do some gentle stretching to wake up their muscles and circular system. SCP-049 is not one of those people. He is a no-muss-no-fuss type through and through. Besides, with gloves, robes, and a mask that are parts of his physical body, it is uncertain if he has any skin that needs caring for, or produces sweat that might need to be washed away. 
We're not sure if you can use Korean sheet masks on Kaiten, but we really don't think that the Plague Doctor would let us try. With no hygiene to worry about, it's time for SCP-049 to get going on his favorite activity, the one that borders on all-encompassing obsession, working towards a cure for the great dying, the pestilence that he has devoted his existence to fighting. Once upon a time, the Foundation was so kind as to offer him corpses to experiment on. But given the Doctor's penchant for resurrecting the dead and turning them into mindless zombies that follow his every command, they decided to do away with that particular program. You can't always get what you want, especially when what you want results in an army of the undead. Living test subjects won't work either, because his deadly touch and his tendency toward, shall we say, unconventional surgical methods, it's just not the best idea. So what's a doc to do? His best with what he's got, of course. Around this time of morning, he sets up a neat row of tools and implements on his favorite workbench, and selects various tissue samples to dissect, to inject with solutions and dissolve in jars, to study from every angle he can until he finally cracks the cure to the pestilence. 10 a.m. The work may be his top priority, but no man is an island. Even a man who isn't quite human needs to engage in polite conversation. We do still live in a society, after all. After working in silence for a couple of hours, the Plague Doctor has gotten into the habit of talking to whoever happens to be passing by his containment facility. Sometimes it's a custodian, mopping up bloodstains. Sometimes it's a doctor he can engage with about their mutual love of science and research. Sometimes it's another SCP, one of the few lucky permitted to roam about the facility without much supervision. Today, it was SCP-507, the reluctant dimension hopper, back from his latest involuntary travel to another world. He was wearing a pair of cargo shorts and a t-shirt emblazoned with a variety of comic book characters. He approached the window of SCP-049's containment cell with a cheerful wave. Hey doc, how's it going? He smiled. Ah, oh, hello! The doctor's eyes shone excitedly from the depths of his mask. How nice it is to see you. I'm having a most productive day. And you? How did you fare on your voyage? You're looking well. I presume it was successful. The Plague Doctor wasn't exactly sure what this friendly man got up to when he was away from the Foundation. Perhaps he was a merchant, or a cartographer charting foreign lands. One of the white-coated scientists had attempted to explain it to him, but was called away by more important affairs before he could have his questions answered. SCP-507 shuddered at the question. Not my favorite. His face paled at the memory. I, I, I don't want to get into it too much, but I'll just say this. Spiders. Lots and lots of spiders. I'm quite sorry to hear that. May your next destination be a better one. SCP-507's frown dissolved into a grin at the doctor's words. Appreciate it, doc. Well, we'll see, I guess. I'm going to go ask God some questions about what happens when we die. Good luck with the science stuff. He pressed a palm to the glass, inviting the Plague Doctor to give him a high five through the window. Haltingly, a bit confused about the gesture, the Doctor pressed his hand to the glass in return. See you around! Indeed! The Doctor waved as the friendly blonde man headed off to explore his own mortality, and probably make a smoothie. 12 p.m. Right at noon, the Doctor pauses his work to enjoy a nice lunch. Like all of his meals, his food is delivered through a slot in the door. His lunch consists mostly often of a wedge of hard cheese, a small bunch of grapes, and some goose liver pâté with crackers. Frequently, he will ask to join the staff and other freely moving anomalies in the cafeteria, but due to safety concerns, he is not permitted to do so. The last thing we need is him brushing hands with someone while reaching for an extra scoop of mashed potatoes, and them dropping dead right there on the tile floor. Still, it is lonely for him to eat in there, watching the rest of the staff walk to lunch gabbing about their weekends and discussing what the soup of the day might be. On this day, the Plague Doctor was having an especially frustrating lunch. As he nibbled delicately on his cheese, he heard a twinkling melody in the distance, very, very faint, coming from somewhere outside. Suddenly, there was a flurry of activity in the hall as Foundation employees made their way towards the source of the music. Excuse me? He called to a passing security guard. What is all the commotion about? Dr. Wright stole an ice cream truck! Free ice cream for everyone! The woman cried giddily. Avalis, what a treat. Might I request you procure a cup for me too? But before he could finish his question, she was already gone, yelling, Don't take all the strawberry before I get there! 
SCP-049 watched, beak pressed against the glass as a parade of people walked past, carrying cones, ice cream bars, bowls piled high with ice cream scoops, hot fudge, nuts, and cherries. It seemed like everyone was enjoying their ice cream, cooling down on a hot day with a sweet treat, except for him. Even some of the other SCPs were getting in on the fun. SCP-999 oozed by the door holding a chocolate vanilla swirl cone, a sundae, and a chocolate-covered frozen banana. It paused at the sight of the doctor's sad expression, making an inquisitive gurgling sound. Good afternoon, dear creature. It seems I've been left out of the festivities, the plague doctor sighed. The tickle monster gurgled again, sliding over to the slot in the door. What are you? He trailed off as the slimy little friend eased the slot open and pushed the sundae and plastic spoon inside. The sundae spilled a little bit on its way in, but remained mostly intact. Thank you. I am ever in your debt, the plague doctor exclaimed. The tickle monster was already departing, off to brighten someone else's day. No matter, someone had remembered him, and for once, he didn't mind being prohibited from eating in the canteen. Even from his cell, he was still a part of things. 1.30 p.m. Every so often, the plague doctor experiences a joyous break in his routine. He is given a test subject. Not a human subject, of course, or even a living subject but a fresh organic specimen nonetheless. As a reward for good behavior and incentive to continue cooperating with the Foundation staff, SCP-049 is occasionally given a deceased animal specimen to dissect and experiment on. In this particular case, it was a large adult cow that I'm told passed away from natural causes after a life of grazing happily in the sun. As the cow's body was wheeled into his containment cell by a group of researchers clad in hazmat suits, the plague doctor clasped his gloved hands together excitedly. One of the researchers leaned over to another and whispered, I thought this was for Sloppy Joe Day. His colleague solemnly shook his head. I here you go, doctor. Another piped up. Marvelous. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. As CP-049 exclaimed, he was so overcome with delight that he patted one of the researchers on the back. The man tensed for a moment, terrified at the sudden physical contact, but relaxed when he remembered that his protective gear protected him from the deadly effects of a touch from the plague doctor. <laughs> yeah, you got it, buddy. The man let out a sigh of relief, heart still racing. Are you feeling quite all right, my friend? The doctor cocked his head to the side, watching the man's face closely. You seem troubled. Perhaps I should provide you with a cursory examination. I would hate to see my benefactor fall ill. <laughs> I'm fine, uh, fine, just uh, a little tired. Lots to do, can't stay, gotta get to the next thing. The man laughed nervously. Come on, let's go. He hissed to his colleagues, rushing towards the exit. They followed, never taking their eyes off the plague doctor as they went. History will remember your contribution to the advancement of medical science. The doctor said solemnly, waving goodbye to the men as they left and resealed the door to the room. 4 p.m. Eureka! cried the plague doctor. After a moment, its eyes opened and it let out a warped, strange, mooing sound that echoed down the halls. It stumbled to its feet, milky eyes rolling around in its head as it took its first breath since it passed away. The cow had been brought back to life, but like all the patients the doctor had successfully cured so far, it was not quite right. It swelled and bulged in strange places. Black slime dribbled from its nostrils and mouth, and it shuffled around the small room aimlessly, waiting for guidance. As it locked eyes with the researcher walking past, looking at it through the glass, it let out another moo, chomping its teeth in anticipation of a bite. Like anyone else briefed on the containment procedures for SCP-049, this man knew that any resurrections were strictly off-limits for the anomaly. No matter how proud the plague doctor was of his little project for the day, he could not be allowed to keep it. It would be confiscated and terminated. He called for his supervisor, and soon a group of armed guards were bursting through the door, tipping the zombie cow we're on her side like a door. group of rural teens on a rowdy night out. All the while, the plague doctor shouted at them, How dare you! Unhand her immediately! But the guards did not listen. They injected the cow with enough tranquilizers to knock out a herd of elephants and hauled it out of the room towards the incinerator. Alone in this room, the plague doctor sat with his head in his hands, making the sound of crying, though no tears could be seen running down his masked face. We talked about this, doctor. A senior researcher spoke to him through the window. You can't have reanimated corpses in your cell. It's a security concern. She was my first breakthrough in months, he wailed. 
With a sigh, the senior researcher pressed a button to aid in calming the distressed anomaly down. A hissing sound filled the containment cell as the scent of fresh lavender was pumped into the space. The doctor lifted his head, taking a deep breath and slowly relaxing his shoulders. Very well. Please do me one favor, my friend. Bring me her brain. I can do that, the senior researcher nodded. But you can't do this again, or we'll have to revoke your test subject privileges again. My work is not a privilege, it is a calling, a necessity! The doctor pounded a gloved fist on the floor. Right, of course. Let me get that brain for you. 7 p.m. Sometime mid-evening, the plague doctor's meal slot opens again as his dinner is pushed through for him to enjoy. Today's supper is roasted potatoes and onions, a cut of baked fish, more crusty bread, and a small cup of fragrant red wine. On special occasions, he is even able to request a second glass of wine to wash down the troubles of the day. After the cow incident, this is not one of those days, so he drinks his one allotted cup slowly, savoring it along with his food. Most culinary enthusiasts would suggest against red wine with fish, but the plague doctor does not live by the rules of man. He makes his own. 8 p.m. After his dinner, SCP-049 begins tidying his workspace, preparing to wind down for the night. He wipes down his work table, clearing it of blood, sweat, and other mysterious liquids. He returns his various tools to their home in his doctor's bag, sealing the lids on his jars and placing them back inside. He works hard, but one cannot work all the time. Rest, taking the time for deep thought, and processing all that he has learned throughout the day is just as vital. 10 p.m. To end the day, the plague doctor engages in one of his few simple pleasures. He reads. He has requested and been provided various texts from the Foundation, ranging from the medical to the literary. He has a compendium of the writings of Hippocrates, Pliny the Elder's texts of medicine and natural science, as well as some modern scientific texts he has largely disregarded. For lighter reading, he has set aside the Canterbury Tales, Lady Chatterley's Lover, The Lover by Marguerite Duras and Madame Bouvray. It seems that when it comes to his fiction, the plague doctor has a bit of a romantic side. He lies on his back, reading by the overhead light, listening as the sounds of the Foundation quiet down for the night. The once bustling facility now has only the occasional footsteps, the sounds of doors closing and machinery being powered down, as those who can go home to their lives on the outside do. But SCP-049 is not one of them. He has always lived for the science, for the work, and now he lives in a research facility full-time. It may not be an ideal life, but he has found a way to make do with it. And tomorrow, he will go up against his greatest enemy, the illness he has sworn to cure once again. And there you have it, folks. A day in the life of the mysterious masked physician. Is there anything from the Plague Doctor's daily routine that you think you might want to start incorporating into your own day-to-day -day lives? Let us know down in the comments. Sometimes, no matter how distant success may seem, we just have to keep working toward our goals. No one exemplifies that better than the oh-so-determined SCP-049 and his tireless attempts to rid the world of the pestilence once and for all. Sure, his methods aren't always the most helpful, but everybody makes mistakes. The most important thing is to try your best. Welcome, dear viewers, to another tale of excitement and intrigue from the archives of the SCP Foundation. Today we're covering a peculiar story titled, Foundation Facilities and How to Loot Them. Our story opens on Shock, a member of SCP-4799, frantically running for her life. SCP-4799, in case you aren't already aware, is a group of smugglers also known by the name Mariachi's Merchants. Now the merchants aren't your average, everyday, under-the-table traders, mind you. This group is capable of trans-universal travel. Stealing advanced technology from other universes, members of Mariachi's Merchants will then sell these devices to turn a profit. Each of these members, of which there are believed to be seven, originally come from a separate universe outside of our own. And Shock? She's one of the best. Blaster in her hand, Shock ran down the corridor, stopping at a T-shaped intersection, frantically trying to decide which way to turn next. The energy weapon in her hand was still warm to the touch. She'd only just fired it down to the last 12 shots. 13, if she was lucky. There was only meant to be one life form nearby the only other living thing in a two-kilometer radius. But Chalk had quickly learned that she was far from alone. Two things wearing lab coats. Things that had perhaps once been human beings were shambling their way closer to her. The nearest door was locked, protected by a keypad, but there was no time to hack her way inside. 
Letting out a growl, Shock turned and opened fire on her pursuers, the pair of creatures that hadn't registered as life forms, but were still inexplicably alive. Energy bolts spat from her blaster, disintegrating them both in an instant. Turning her focus to the nearby door, Shock pushed a thin black device into a keycard slot, connected to a thin screen that controlled it. She grumbled about how what had seemed like a simple scavenging mission had gone south so quickly. The planet appeared to be dead, at least from the perspective of the Mariachi's merchant ship in orbit. What was the worst that could happen? Turns out, losing communication with her crew, for one. They'd been radio silent after the ship was reportedly fired upon. The merchants had promised to come back for shock once they'd shaken off whoever was shooting at them. The facility she was trying to scavenge had once belonged to the SCP Foundation, presumably a long time ago, codenamed Site-101. Built under a spacecraft launch compound, it should have been a gold mine filled with all sorts of valuable technology. But so far, it didn't seem like there was anything left in the facility that justified the dangerous trip. The keypad flashed green as the door unlocked. Shock collected up her hacking device as the door opened, and one of the creatures appeared on the other side. Reacting with incredible speed, Shock blasted the creature into dust, cursing at its body as it disintegrated atom by atom. What were these things? And why did the merchant's sensors not read them as life forms? She pushed the question to the back of her mind. There was a time and place to contemplate what could be classified as alive, and this was neither. Hurtling down the newly opened corridor, Shock headed towards an open office door. Hiding as quietly as possible in the office, making sure the door was secure enough that those horrors outside wouldn't follow her, Shock took a moment to calm herself. She sat herself down on a leather chair in front of the dark wood desk that filled most of the space in the office. It had belonged to one Dr. Dwyer, according to the computer that stood atop the desk, which Shock began to hack into, once again using her keycard cracking device. After about a half an hour working through some very sophisticated security software, she eventually managed to force her way into the computer and started clicking through its files. The first thing she uncovered in a folder that was conveniently labeled important was an email from the O5 command to the director of this abandoned former Foundation site. Along with other high-ranking members of personnel, the subject simply read, Farewell. In the email, O5-7 mentioned that the last number of escape ships had successfully launched from Site-101 and arrived at colony stations. It seemed that some kind of war was imminent and would ravage the entire Earth, leaving nothing behind. So, in their infinite wisdom, the SCP Foundation had been using its vast resources to evacuate its personnel off-world. Meanwhile, the personnel at Site-101 would stay at their posts, perhaps to repopulate or rebuild the Earth after the impending war had passed. That email had been sent in the year 2217, a whole 18 years before Shock had arrived at this facility hoping to raid it. The next email in the folder was headed with the words, Intruder, sent just under a month before. A pair of Foundation security personnel, Officer Sanchez and Meche, had happened across a breach in the ventilation system. According to their reports, it looked as if someone or something had forced its way in with some kind of metal implement. Shortly after, a third officer, Officer Peterson, failed to respond to a radio check seemingly going missing. Security had been advised to travel in groups and engage any unknown entity with lethal force. Something had made its way into the facility and it had arrived just before Shock did. Uneasy, still not sure what had happened here, the dimension-hopping scavenger read on. The third and final email entry had been sent the day after the last. This time, security had a better idea of what they were up against. Surveillance footage from within the facility had revealed the intruder to be none other than SCP-049. It had claimed the lives of multiple security officers, with two of them confirmed to have been instances of SCP-049-2. Being from a different universe, however, Shock had no idea what an SCP-049 was, nor did she like the idea of being trapped with one. Now, in case you, like Shock, haven't heard of the infamous Plague Doctor, then here's a brief bit of context on SCP-049. A tall figure, shrouded in long black robes, a hood over his head, with only a white, beaked mask protruding from underneath. These aren't just parts of his attire, though. The SCP Foundation discovered that all of the pieces of SCP-049's outfit are part of his physical body, made out of muscle and bone. The Plague Doctor's primary goal is to find those he deems to be infected with something he refers to as the Pestilence. 
If he ever senses this affliction, he will attempt to make direct skin contact with the person carrying it. SCP-049's touch is lethal, killing anyone who comes into contact with him in a matter of minutes. You might think that's all the Plague Doctor does, going from person to person, killing them via touch. But you would be wrong. Once he has killed the victim, SCP-049 then begins performing a crude, outdated form of surgery on their corpse. Using equipment he produces from his mysterious medical bag, he injects a number of unknown chemicals into a person's carcass, eventually turning them into an instance of SCP-049-2. In other words, a zombie. And that's exactly what it had done to at least two of the Site-101 security officers. When Shock delved further into the computer, examining some security footage, not only did she watch a monstrosity in a shredded security uniform shambling through a corridor, but there was something else following it. A figure, completely clad in black robes, its face shrouded behind an eerie beaked mask. Shock decided her best course of action was to find out as much as she could about SCP-049. Then, using the facility's security cameras to figure out the quickest route to find any propulsion tech that the Foundation might have left lying around, she familiarized herself with the Foundation's extensive file on SCP-049, learning what the Plague Doctor could do. The part Shock found to be particularly unsettling was knowing that the entity could shut down an organism's biological functions whenever it made direct skin contact. Best to try and avoid him, she told herself. Studying the camera feeds, Shock noticed SCP-049-2s that had all been the former staff of this facility. They didn't seem to move around much, unless provoked. All she had to do was make it through the corridors to a door labeled Propulsion Testing, without the Dash 2s noticing her. Sounds easy in theory, and it would have been easier in practice if there weren't currently eight of the zombies standing in her path to the testing room. With a tight grip around her blaster, Shock bolted from the office, barreling at full sprint down the corridor. She already knew from watching the cameras that the first of the SCP-049-2s was around the nearest corner. Opening fire, she went speeding past its remains as it turned into little more than a smoldering pile on the floor. Around the next corner were another two of the creatures, dispatched as quickly as the first with a bright blue crackle of the energy weapon. So far, so good. But Shock was already anticipating seeing a group of five SCP-049-2s huddled together, the next obstacle in her way. Sure enough, she had navigated her way through the facility's hallways towards them, making sure she had the element of surprise on her side. She blasted the oncoming mob of zombies, screaming as they were struck by the blue light of her blaster, only to vanish, vaporize forever. All except for the fifth and final SCP-049-2 instance. Shock had fired her fifth shot too soon, missing the last of the creatures. She waited for it to close the distance between them, hoping for a closer target, but the monstrosity knocked the gun from her hands. Shock pulled a fusion bomb from her bag, wrapping the unstable energy cell in her coat, she let the creature grab the makeshift bomb from her, picking up her weapon, and running as the bomb detonated. Exhausted, she reached the propulsion testing room, injured after her fight with the Dash 2. Shock had hoped her troubles were over, and for a moment, they certainly seemed to be. She had stumbled across a mother load of tech, modified reality anchors, and all kinds of equipment that would be perfect salvage. But then, from the shadows, something new stepped forward. The Plague Doctor himself. Shock drew her blaster again and pulled the trigger, but the weapon was spent, sparking in her hands as it failed to fire. Frozen, she stared at SCP-049, and it stared back. Lowering her weapon, Shock tried to calmly introduce herself to the looming cloaked anomaly. I I'm Shock. Nice to meet you. You're... Or rather, these people call you SCP-49, right? Sure did a bang-up job of carrying everyone in here from the looks of things. For a moment, they talked. SCP-049 had heard the Foundation personnel at Site-101 talking of being the last men on Earth, and made its way into the facility to save them, as he put it, ridding them of the pestilence. Shock explained that the rest of the planet's surface outside had been severely irradiated, and that there was no one living up top anymore, all while sneakily sliding pieces of expensive-looking tech into her bag. SCP-049 argued that there were still people left on Earth, that Site-42 housed the very last remnants of humanity. But they had been untouched by disease. They were pure. But Shock didn't care one bit. Instead, she made a move nobody would have expected. She offered the Plague Doctor a lift. The Mariachi's merchants would be coming back for her soon, and their ship was able to take them anywhere in the multiverse. After pondering for a moment, 
SCP-049 asked to be taken with them to find where the rest of the sick were, unwilling to accept his work was done. As long as you agree to keep your hands to yourself, Shock told him, as a gray orb appeared in the room hovering above the floor without touching the ceiling. It was time to leave. Now go check out SCP-049 The Plague Doctor Captured and SCP-049 What Actually Is the Pestilence The Plague Doctor Questions and Theories for more videos that definitely won't give you the pestilence. Seriously, we promise.